Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and uh, this, if you haven't watched it before, is a show, an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. And if you'd like to get more information or help to support this whole undertaking, please go to batgap.com. That's B A T G A P.com. My guest today is Craig Holiday. And I'm going to switch to him so you can see his beautiful baby that is in his arms, who won't be there for the entire interview. Um, Craig is both a non-dual teacher and a licensed professional counselor, offering non-dual therapy and meditation workshops, retreats, and satsang. His work is dedicated to the discovery of our innate divinity through embracing our humanity. He's got a little bundle of humanity right there. Uh, he works in a way that addresses our everyday suffering as a doorway to our inherent freedom. He meets with individuals in Durango, Colorado, and from around the world on Skype. Craig will be telling us his whole story, but just to, in a nutshell, at, at just 19, um, Craig began apprenticing under his teacher, David, whom I'm kind of curious about, in southwestern Colorado. David is a little-known meditation master who lives a private meditative life, and he guided Craig for 20 years in the lineage of Sri Aurobindo. This relationship deeply shaped Craig's life and teachings. During the last 10 years, Craig also studied with Adyashanti, who guided him through four profound awakenings, head, heart, hara, and kundalini. Upon request from others, Craig began sharing these non-dual teachings in satsang. Over the years, Craig has received ongoing support with teaching in his personal life from David, Adya, John Burney, whom I've interviewed, Lama Tsultrim, whom I haven't, and others. Despite profoundly awakening to the truth of his own being, Craig also understands the evolutionary nature of our souls and values the work of continually examining our humanity, both individually and with teachers, while surrendering to our divinity in greater and greater ways. He share, shares this same invitation with others. So, that was great, Craig. Nice introduction. I've never had a baby on the show before, so... Thanks, Rick. Yeah. What's yeah, the baby's is, name? This is Ani Sophia. Oh, and she's so nine weird. months old, uh -huh. and she is a wonderful, beautiful little baby. Yeah, she's also my teacher, mm -hmm. <laughs> and quite incredible. I'm so happy to have her in my life. I'm really, uh, really fortunate. So I'm going to give her to my wife now. Okay, I just thought it'd be fun to have her on yeah, the show it's for a really minute. Really fun, and she's so well behaved <laughs> at the moment. Ooh. <laughs> Say bye bye. <laughs> bye, Ani Sophia. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Uh, do you have any other kids? Yep, I have a 13-year-old uh, daughter as well. Okay. She's, she's not so excited about her father. <laughs> <laughs> She'll get over it. Yeah, yeah. We had, we had 10 years of uh, just bliss, and then the teenage years came, and, yeah. you know, she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. Right. So, um, mostly, the, as listeners and as you know, interviews such as this consist of two main components. One is the individual's personal story and the other is their teaching whatever they're teaching and sure. um, sometimes i do more of one than the other sometimes i do first the story then the teaching sometimes the other way around but i was thinking in your case you have quite an interesting story and it might be interesting to start with that and that could be, provide a kind of a foundation for the knowledge stuff that we'll be getting into a, a little later and we have all the time in the world. We can go a couple hours, if you like, or whatever, as long as it takes to really unpack everything you have to say. Sure. Um, I guess the big question is, uh, where do you want me to start? And um, if you can help me uh -huh. uh, with questions, because I've... Oh, uh, I will. I will. I've uh, I lost a large chunk of my memory, <laughs> so sometimes it's really difficult. No, I'll definitely help you with questions. and uh, stories. Yeah, and we'll help each other, because... Um, you know, when I'm talking to somebody, they know their whole life and their teaching and everything better than I do. Um, sure. It's like when I work with clients, you know, in my search engine business, uh, they know their business better than I do. So I need to collaborate. So this is a collaborative thing and we'll, sure. we'll go back and forth and I won't run out of questions and I don't think you'll run out of things to say. As a matter of okay. fact, I, I've kind of found it interesting listening to you and uh, uh, as I always do listen to teachers before I interview them. Uh, because you can go on for like an hour or so just saying stuff that I haven't, it's a little similar to what you've said in other ones, but there's always a uniqueness and a freshness and an originality as it rolls. And uh, I think, well, I'm really not cut out to be a teacher uh, at this stage of the game because I couldn't do that. Uh, I, I'm much better at just a asking questions and interacting with sure. the people. 
That's kind of the way Francis Lucille is, actually. He, he doesn't like to give talks. He just waits until somebody has a question, and then he responds. Otherwise, he doesn't have much to say. Sure. Yeah. All right, so to get rolling with you. So you, in your bio, you mentioned that you met your teacher, David, at the age of 19. So what got you going? I mean, what made you feel like, hmm, there must be, what, what's all this spirituality stuff about? Yeah, so, you know, when I was young, maybe, um, I don't know, 10 or 11, you know, I used to go to church, the, the Catholic church, and I think I used to just walk in, and as soon as I'd walk in, I just felt the presence of God there, and, mm -hmm. and I was always just struck um, just by how much divinity was there. Mm -hmm. And so as a little kid, I just thought I was going to be a priest. I wasn't really sure what a priest was or what they did, but when I saw them, you know, just standing, say, up on the, um, the front of the church there, I just noticed it like they were playing with energy. You know, and I just as a kid, I thought, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's what my life is about. And I think um, I grew up in a pretty conservative family in the Midwest. And when I was about 14, I started to have, um, started to have all these really interesting spiritual experiences. I didn't really know what they were at the time. I would just, you know, sit down and it was like my room would come alive or nature would come alive and hmm. almost like things would, it wasn't that they were moving, but it just seemed that everything was radiating with just like a sense of grace. And also... I presume um, this was happening naturally and you hadn't imbibed any substances. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I knew nothing about yoga or meditation or anything like that, especially in those days. That was, you know, unheard of in, say, Midwest Ohio. Um, and, you know, at, at some point, uh, yeah, as I said I was 14, and, you know, I was taking a class, and we were studying, say, the world's religions, and the teacher just mentioned a couple of different things. He mentioned vegetarianism, and he mentioned Hinduism and Buddhism, and right away, I, I just became a vegetarian, and without even, you know, thinking about it much, it was just like, oh, yeah, I'm just not going to eat meat anymore, and, and just, and then I started to, uh, I started to spontaneously meditate, and, um, I yeah, just did that. I would sit in my room every night for whatever, 20 minutes or a half hour. Every night, my dad would walk in and wonder, you know, what the hell I was doing, I think is what he would say to me, yeah. and I didn't have much response. <laughs> but at some point, um, you know, I moved out to Colorado to go to college and pretty much answered an ad in the paper uh, for a labor position, just digging holes is pretty much what it was for. And, and that's when I met my teacher, David, and um, was he digging he, holes also? Well, so he he recently moved to town, and he was building a retreat center, uh -huh. and so he needed some help, you I know, see. digging some foundations. We mm -hmm. built a greenhouse. I built a bunch of retreat houses for him and gardens and all sorts of things. I worked for him for you know almost twenty years. Wow. And, so how come this guy is so uh, anonymous and elusive if he's got a retreat house and everything? I mean, I've never heard of him outside of the talking, you know, outside yeah. of my connection with you. Yeah, um, you know, honestly, I don't know. Like he, his teacher was Hilda Charlton. Oh yeah, in New York, right? In New York, yeah. yeah. I so have friends um, who've been with her. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so he studied under her, and I think he was pretty much her main disciple. And then she asked him, you know, when before she passed on, I think she would have like you know six hundred people would come and listen to her speak at Saint John the Divine in New York City, and he asked her if um, I'm sorry, she asked him if he wanted a big following. You know, and if she wanted to take, if he wanted to take on all of this, and he said no, he he pretty much, you know, didn't want anything to do with the huge group, and mm -hmm. he's, you know, always had a very small group with him, and yeah, you know, if you look at the life of Sri Aurobindo and the work that Sri Aurobindo did, um, you know, Sri Aurobindo, I think he didn't meet with anyone for the last twenty years of his life or mm -hmm. so, and so my teacher David's been the same way, just a very small group. He doesn't have a website. He's yeah. He told me he's taught for, I think, 40 years and never put up a flyer or anything. But Just word of mouth. Was Hilda a disciple of Sri Aurobindo? Hilda wasn't. Hilda was actually a disciple of uh, Satya uh, Sai Baba oh, I didn't know in that. India. And she uh -huh. spent about 17 years in India before anyone went there mm. and toured around and you know studied with all kinds of yogis and avatars. Mm. And, and so um, the thing with David is he's just one of those individuals who so much grace and so much energy and power and light comes through. I've never actually met anyone else like him. And I've, hmm. you know, been throughout India, you know, 
hung out with Ama a bunch and studied with you know Sai Baba in India and met all kinds of Western non-dual teachers. And David, he's just one of those individuals who's, um, it's almost like he's not human. Hmm. You know, he's just just so incredible and so amazing. So, you know, live. Are you so still I, in touch with him? You know, I, I haven't actually, um, you know, been to his class in the last year or so, but mm-hmm. I've, I pretty much, um, you know, grew up with him. I think of him as a father. Yeah. Well, if you're ever in touch and, you know, if he ever feels like doing an interview, yeah, I'd be interested. Um, yeah. Sounds like an interesting guy. Yeah. And, he's, uh, he's quite, you know, quite, I've had people tell me they don't want to do interviews because they don't want their teaching scene to get any bigger than it is. They, they want to keep it small. So I understand that. But he, he, it's nice to have these kind of unknown people. Yeah. 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 In fact, yes. that's sometimes the criterion by which we judge who to have on the show is how much they want to be on. The more they want it, the less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you you spent like twenty years with David, working, digging holes, you know. Yeah, apprenticing with him, working side by side. I mean, we'd meet, you know, uh, every week, you know, for three hours for meditation or satsang, and you know, sometimes twice a week, and. You know, um, like I said, he was like a father to me. So anytime I had a question or anything come up in my life, you know, I could just easily go to him. And or oftentimes, if something was going on in my life, he would just call me and say, "Hey, you know, what's going on with you?" Deeply intuitive, you know, yeah. just incredible, incredible being, nice. incredible relationship. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I I work with so many people, you know, throughout the world, and you know, most people just have their teachers on YouTube, and they don't get to. Um, you know, meet with a teacher, and so I feel really gifted, and you know that I could spend so much time with him. Yeah. So, uh, so you know better than I do what the milestones will be in in this story, but um, maybe some of the highlights of the kinds of things you experienced when you were with David, and the sorts of openings and awakenings and whatnot that you had would be interesting for people. Sure, sure. Well, with David, it's it was a progressive path. Uh-huh. You know, which is you know very different than say the path that I studied with, say Aja, and um, you know the teaching was you meditate every day, you open to grace, you open to your direct experience yeah. of God in every moment. You know, the and, last time I saw Rupert Spira at the Sand Conference a few months ago, and you were there. Uh, sure. my, my last comment to him because I was in a rush was, uh, Rupert, the direct path is progressive. And then his wife chimed in. She said, yeah, Francis Lucille says that, too. I said, we'll have that discussion another time. But, yeah. I, I, you know, when, it, when you say direct path, I mean, some people think, bingo, I'm going to just be there, and that's it. But yeah. it, it, it's, it's progressive, whether you like it or not. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely the case. You know, even, you know, so I'd studied with David, and then, you know, at some point I'd go and see Adya, you know, and I'd have these huge, you know, non-dual transcendent awakenings, and I'd come back and talk to David about it, and he'd say, oh, that's nothing. You know, to, to my utter dismay, you yeah. know, you would say that's, you know, that's nothing. He's like, that's just, you know, that's something quite small. Yeah. It's like you don't even know, you know, what we are capable of. And so, I mean, the, the path of Sri Aurobindo, I mean, you know, basically it's not about individual enlightenment. You know, it's about enlightenment for all of humanity. It's it's changing the, it's upgrading the, the species. I mean, it's a very radical Yeah approach is radically different than, um, you know, the, the non-dual path that most of us speak about. And so, you know, with David, it was just meeting with him, you know, on a daily basis, opening to grace and actually feeling energies and movements of grace, you know, that would, you know, be almost like downloading into your body, into your being, you know, and affecting you, say, um, on the realm of material, you know, and so... It's just like it's, I spent just years working with that, mm. you know, and opening to that. And, you know, some of the grace is incredibly blissful. And other times it feels like a, a jackhammer is being driven through your body. I mean, it's it's a quite a, um, should I say, painful uh, approach because you have to give every part of yourself. And so, you know, one of the big things that my teacher taught me was to not to be afraid of pain, you know, to open to pain fully, to fully experience pain, and to be willing to surrender just every aspect of yourself. And so I think that was his teaching, and that's what I got, you know, so much from him, was just to, to be able to fully open to that movement through you and to, get, and to give everything. Did you find that um, your capacity or ability to do that 
was a developmental thing. In other, in other words, you, you weren't able to sit oh, down. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can't just sit down day one and say, okay, I'm fully open, let it all you know, gush out yeah. of me. <laughs> it, it, it's because it's all locked up pretty tight, you know, so it had to be kind sure. of loosened up level by sure. level. Yes? Sure, sure, absolutely. And, and you know, the work of Sri Aurobindo, I don't know if we want to spend too much time on, on his work, but, you know, it's going through your body, you know, your mental mind, your your emotional mind, you know, and the different minds within you, and opening to to receiving grace in those places within yourself and allowing them to be transformed. And so it takes years. I mean, it's something that Sri Aurobindo gave his life to, the mother gave her life to it, mm -hmm. you know, who, who followed him. And um, it's just, it's an ongoing surrender. And, you know, it's, it's like if all that grace came at once, it would probably kill you. Yeah, yeah. I've read that in a number of places from a number of teachers. They say, you know, you don't want this all at once, immediately, completely. Yeah. You know, it would totally burn you out. Yeah, um, and your nervous system couldn't handle it. Your mind couldn't handle it. I mean, in a lot of places, you become quite disoriented in it. Yeah, and even now, I mean, you just told me that you might need a little help because a big chunk of your memory is gone. <laughs> I mean, yeah. do you feel like, well, I don't want to get ahead of the story, but do, do you sort of feel like even that might be symptomatic of your being a work in progress and perhaps five years from now or something, the memory will be functioning more normally? You know, I don't know what, what I've found. And, you know, this is what David told me, and actually Adya told me the same thing, is that, mm -hmm. that uh, what you need to remember yeah. will come forward. Yep will come forward. And to me, it's actually a great relief to have the past fall out of you, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's much easier to live and to experience life through the present moment without a past. Yep. And uh, so that's a good point to just highlight because a, a lot of t spiritual teachers say that too, that, you know, 95% of our thoughts are extraneous and irrelevant and to the to the situation at hand and mm -hmm. in a more efficiently functioning mind and body that you know there would be relatively few thoughts but whenever you needed to have some memory or some thought it would come to hand appropriate to the situation sure absolutely and so much of our egoic nature is i mean maybe all of it is based in the past you know, and constantly projecting that past into the present moment. Mm -hmm. And we create so much suffering for ourselves and others, you know, through living in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of suffering, I heard you recount uh, a lot of Kundalini stuff you went through. Was, was that with David or later on with other teachers or what? Uh, that was with David and with Adya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, um, you know, if we... If, you know, if I just summed up the relationship with David, I mean, it was a pretty traditional, um, like, guru and apprentice relationship, you know, like, we build a temple on top of, you know, on top of this, this hill on his property, you know, it's basically on top of a mountain, and I said, oh, David, you know, let's build a temple down here where the ground is soft and things are easy, and he said, no, we'll build the temple up there, and it was, you know, where there was no road, and so mm -hmm. consisted of carrying all the tools up there, all the materials, bags of concrete, I mean, it was a ridiculous relationship, because <laughs> when, you, when you're in a relation, you know, when you're in that, say, that guru-apprentice relationship, the teacher doesn't care what you think, what you feel, you know, what your ego wants and desires are, mm -hmm. you know, the teacher follows what is true in them, what's true in their heart, what God is telling them to do, and so, you know, that's probably the biggest thing that I got from David was this sense of, okay, God's the boss. My mind isn't the boss. My rational mind may think it knows one thing, but, you know, God has a different plan for us. And so it's that, just that life of continual surrender, and it kind of pushes you to, you know, to your edge and to your limit and to, to that breaking point, you know, and, of course, the, the breaking point can be the breaking point of, you know, becoming really angry or furious or the breaking point of allowing your heart to break open mm. and saying, okay, yes, yes, you win. You're the boss and I will follow, I will follow your lead. But presumably David did that with compassion and genuine connection to God because obviously oh, absolutely. there have been egregious examples of teachers abusing that relationship and you know, yeah. just their egos like screwing people around. Yeah, well, you know, if, if a teacher was doing that, you know, then it's the job of the student to, to leave yeah. and or to speak up, you know. Right. But in this case with David, it's interesting because, I, you know, I was in, you know, a very intimate relationship with him for 20 plus years or 20 years. And, 
And he was one of those individuals who I never saw him come out of alignment with God. Mm. And that's, that's quite amazing. If you imagine just being with anyone, <laughs> for, you know, for any period of time to see them never come out of alignment, it's just... Insofar as it's you like, could judge. It's so far as I could judge. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, you know, he just was deeply surrendered yeah. to the divine. You know, I don't want to, you know, speak about perfection because I think perfection has huge shadows, right. you know, in it. But, but he was just one of those individuals. He, yes, he treated me with love. He treated me with a deep respect, un, you know, unconditional love. Yeah. Yet at the same time, he didn't care about my ego. And it's a very interesting relationship to have because most of us, we meet on the level of ego. You know, people try to keep things nice, nice, and, you know, everyone's polite and this and that. But at some point, like, if you truly want to live beyond ego, you know, it's it can be helpful to get into a relationship where you begin to experience, well, what is it like to live in relationship with someone beyond ego, beyond your own, you know, desires or your, you know, your needs of being heard or seen or whatever it is. You know, but like you said, there's a great danger in that, too. Yeah, and some people kind of get lured in gradually and they don't know when to cut, you know, when to bail um, because sure. there's this un underlying assumption that gets reinforced that, well, the, the teacher is infallible because the teacher is in mm -hmm. tune with divine intelligence and who am, sure. and, and the teacher seems to be doing screwy things, but who am I to judge, you know, mm -hmm. because the divine intelligence is inscrutable and uh, mm -hmm. so I better just kind of go along with it. Sure. Uh, and, sure. You know, well, well, again, that's, you know, that. that's, that's your turn, you know, or our turn as a student to be like, hey, like something stinks here. Yeah. You know, it's time to go. And, you know, I, I actually, you know, met with a lot of, you know, Aja's, uh, you know, students in his inner circle. It's like, you know, hey, like, you know, what's it like? And they're like, oh, yeah, like he is, he's clear, he's clean, you know, he's, he's professional. Mm -hmm. And that's what my re relationship with David has always been like. It's been crystal clear, it's been clean, and it's been, for some reason, the word professional is coming to mind. And, Rick, I can say I've met a lot of teachers, you know, who have screws loose, who have, you know, playing with power games or money games or, you know, sex games or whatever it is. And, um, you know, normally you can feel it right away. You're like, oh, like this stinks. Mm. And yeah, now it's time. Now it's time for me to go. Yeah. You know, and I think it's good, you know, as if we're going to study with anyone just to have a good, clear level of discernment of, you know, what's what's helpful and what's not. Yeah, I think it's very important. And it's a it's a, you know, takes two to tango. I mean, absolutely. Maybe, you know people get attracted to the teacher that they deserve or that they are ready for and sure. uh you know there could be a rather dysfunctional relationship because both parties are dysfunctional sure. <laughs> but no um, that's and that's absolutely the case you know oftentimes you know people say well this teacher was doing that and you know this other teacher is doing this thing but it's like well who are we to demand that a teacher be perfect right you know to demand a teacher to be perfect that's that's crazy you know, it's like, we're not perfect. I mean, I'm certainly not yeah. perfect. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, I think we put too much pressure on, you know, others to be perfect. You know, and that's, you know, it's like, why are we projecting that onto someone? Why can't we just meet someone with an openness and an honesty and be like, hey, like, I want some help growing. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so tell us a bit about all the Kundalini stuff you went through. I think it's important. I mean, getting a lot of kind of like, input lately about people having kundalini experiences and we're trying to set up a, an interview with some lady who specializes in, in dealing with such cases so sure. it might be good to dwell on that for a bit sure um okay so i you know if we're going to follow some linear story then this, this okay, might yeah. be a look be fe little... feel free to keep going linear if i ask you if well, i, if I leapfrog that... on some question just Okay, yeah. so um, so at some point, say about 10 years in my relationship with David, uh, I started studying with Adya as well. Mm -hmm. um, because the thing that Adya offered was that you can wake up right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that you can, you can transcend your mind, your thoughts, your emotions. You can, be, you can basically uh, step into the world of freedom right now. And even as a young kid, that always attracted me. And so I started to listen to Adya and... and um, you know, right away, I had a, I had two profound uh, transcendent awakenings, which were which were quite amazing, and then that those awakenings then deep deepened into uh, a heart awakening, 
And at some point um, there, that's when the Kundalini came forward. Okay, so describe these, you know, let's not presume everybody knows what a transcendent awakening and a heart awakening is. What was your actual experience? Yeah, sure. So with most people I think that I meet with, um, and most people in non-dual circles, you know, I think they're speaking about the transcendent awakening. You know, these are the teachings, say, of Eckhart Tolle or what Ajahn tends to emphasize on. But it's a sense that... that Although in fairness to them, Ajahn, both Eckhart and Ajahn do talk a lot about integration and embodiment oh, and so on. Oh, absolutely. You know, Eckhart's absolutely. talking about the pain body and the stuff you have to work out and all that. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, I didn't mean they, they spoke exclusively okay. about it. But that's one of the things that, that Ajahn is good at is, is many people can just, you know, walk into his presence and then boom you know, they step into this transcendent realm. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm speaking about. Okay. So, so basically, um, the transcendent awakening is waking up beyond your mind and beyond your emotions as who and what you are. Mm -hmm. Waking up into the, to the vast space of awareness as who and what you are. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're actually waking up and out of your humanity, waking up and out of your body, and this is where a lot of people, they, they have this experience and then they say all, this, all of a sudden they think, I'm perfect, I'm free, everything in life is perfect, there is nobody here, no one's alive or you know, whatever you know, yeah, people yeah. say, you know, and it gets a little bit, <laughs> it gets a little bit silly. And, you know, in a sense, you know, and I've even spoken to Adi about this, about that, that the transcendent awakening, it is by far the biggest delusion, you know, that, that we can experience because when you wake up out of ego, you, you experience such bliss, such freedom, such openness that you feel so empty of self. And you, in a sense, you're blasted into, say, a transcendent world, uh, almost like a, it's almost like a heaven world. It feels like you're not living on earth any longer. And it's quite amazing. It's quite profound. It is a huge shift in consciousness. And yet... Um, you know, it is definitely not the full thing. Yeah. I actually have a quote from Adya here that I read last week. I think I'll just read it again because yeah, it's sure, such please. a good one. It, um, he said, it can be very difficult for any spiritual teacher to get through to students who are fixating on the absolute view as an unconscious way of avoiding their humanness to get them to stop holding on to their absolute view. This is one of the dangers of awakening, the tendency to grasp at a lopsided view. We grasp at the absolute view of awakening, we deny anything else. It's actually the ego that fixates on the absolute view and the absolute in this way, using it as an excuse for dismissing unenlightened behavior, thought patterns, and divided emotional states. As soon as we have grasped onto any one view of things, we have gone blind to everything else. That's from his book, The End of Your World. Anyway. Sure, absolutely. And the, the other reason the ego fixate, fixates on it is because it feels so wonderful. Yeah. It feels so wonderful, but if you but if you look at what freedom is, what freedom truly is, you have to be free of your mind, free of your emotions, and that means you have to be free, you know, of what you think and what you feel. Mm -hmm. And so, most individuals, if you feel incredibly, you know, spiritual or profound or vast, you know, you take that to believe that oh, this is it, this is the ultimate reality, and this feels so good. Right. Therefore, this must be good. This must be perfection. This must be the total picture. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people work with a lot of individuals who open into this space and they're like, oh, you know, you know, this is it. I've discovered the whole thing. And, you know, sometimes people come to satsang and they are in a session with me and they awaken to this. And then I'm going, oh, boy, now I just lost them. <laughs> But again, like well, how long said, does that? I, I mean, in your experience, how long does that really last for people be, before the kind of the other half of life starts crashing in? Yeah, well, uh, for me, my awakening was quite messy, mm -hmm. and so during that transcendent stage, I mean, that went on for a number of years, mm -hmm. you know, where it was just, you know, just feeling just overwhelmed, you know, with space. Mm -hmm. It felt like my mind was the sky. You know, and so that went on for a number of years. But also during that time, because, um, how should I say this politely about myself? But because I didn't have, you know, my life wasn't all taken care of. I wasn't practicing yoga. You know, I, I wasn't, you know, crystal clear in my humanity. My humanity kept coming forward. And so I had this very messy experience of, 
you know, having aspects of my life, you know, come forward. I was going through a real, you know, messy divorce and custody stuff. And so I live in this space of, you know, you know, space and freedom and just overwhelming bliss. And then all of a sudden my egoic nature would come forward, you know, and, and, you know, I kind of bounced back and forth with that for a number of years. In a sense, I think that's a really good thing because, you know, those things come forward because they're wanting to be transformed. And if, say, we look at God, we can say that, well, God is both the transcendent, spacious vastness, right? But God, God is also this dynamic evolutionary force. And so that evolutionary force, you know, because we're, we are a part of evolution, well, God wants us to evolve as well. And so those things were coming forward into my consciousness to be healed, to be worked out, you know, to be released to be transformed mm -hmm. in a sense um you know that's that's when the embodiment process comes so you said you had two transcendent awakenings were they distinct from one another or just no i think well let me think about that were they distinct yeah they, they were they were distinct like you the know second, the second one was somehow more profound than the first one or something yeah so the the first one came i i wrote the story of this in my book um the first one came in the sense that I was um, I was at the end of a divorce. I was working for my teacher. I was running two businesses. I was going to graduate school to be become a therapist. I think I was also remodeling my house, and so I had all this psychological pressure going on within me. And at some point, I realized just just one day I was um, I was with my daughter, and she was. Um, her mom had just pulled up to pick her up and I was pouring her a glass of lemonade and I just started to tremble and I dropped this pitcher of lemonade on the table and then I just fell to my knees and um, and it was just like everything broke open within me. My, my egoic nature knew that I, I couldn't hold together my life any longer and that's one of the primary functions of our ego is to create, a, say, an artificial sense of control. And I, I got to be careful I don't go into the experience, but in the sense of... Well, you went into it in your book. Yeah, no, but I mean, I mean in this moment. Oh, you don't want to evoke it. I don't yeah. want to get overwhelmed, but... Yeah. But, um, so I fell on my knees and, right. you know, I basically surrendered to God and, you know, cried my eyes out for four or five hours. It's just all this weight of just egoic, I guess maybe karma or things from my past just emptied out of me. Yeah. And I began to laugh hysterically, you know, at the same time. And, and then all of a sudden I just like, I woke up into this, in this new world. It just felt like, oh, it, it felt like this is heaven on earth. You know, there was a sense of just stepping out of ego, allowing all that pressure to release, and then just living in this, say, this crystal clear reality of, mm. of say, this moment. You know, it was, it, was, it was quite an amazing experience. And so that would say like the first big crack, you know, Aji often talks about, you know, like when the ego cracks open. And so that's what it was, is it cracked open. And it was like my consciousness exploded into this, into this transcendent realm of, of just openness and vastness here on earth. Yeah. When I first, when I heard you tell that story in your book, uh, yeah. uh, the thought that came to mind is, not to discount all the years, even decades of spiritual practice you had done. The, yeah. that, those, that was not like coincidental. It, that had kind of built up a, a head of steam, so to speak, that had finally caused the boiler to explode. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, yeah you know, Rick, I've, I've, I've gone back and forth about that. Like, I'm a big fan of meditation. I sit for mm -hmm. every day and I sit every day and I, I'm a fan of of you know spiritual practice and spiritual work but t at that time it seemed as if the two had nothing to do with each other now now that may not be true but it just seemed it just it seemed that 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 this was god and everything i was doing before that was almost like you know, excuse my language but like peeing in the wind <laughs> you know and of course that's probably not true but that's what it seemed like it seems that way to a lot of people a lot of people say that yeah and, and, and we uh, have to be really careful with that with that yeah. what seems true right at the time and that's why i say that the transcendent awakening 
it can be like a delusion because it seems like, oh, because it feels this way, then therefore that means this is true. Yeah. Do you know uh, what you, I mean? Yeah, sure. And I'm sure you've heard the saying, uh, you know, enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. Absolutely. It's like this kind of thing happens to people out of the blue yeah. who haven't done any spiritual practice, but it happens more, it's more likely to happen to people who have actually been chugging away at it for a while. Yeah, and I could qualify that more and say that people who continue to do spiritual practice, mm -hmm. then their awakening tends to solidify. Mm -hmm. People who don't, their awakening tends to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I actually get flack from some people and from some friends, but for emphasizing on this spiritual practice point, they think I'm just yeah. kind of addicted to it or hung up on it or something. But I'm just going from my own experience and, and from mm -hmm. my own understanding, which is that it continually stokes the fire, you know, it, and it integrates and it, it you know, and, and there may come a time when I completely drop all spiritual practice and feel, but it, it feel also like it's totally re irrelevant. But it um, keeps you, you us know that honest. When you get to it. Yeah, yeah, it keeps us honest and it keeps us humble. And I think you're. I think it's so true that there's too many people, especially in the non-dual community, think, okay, I've awa I've awoken and now everything is done. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, is it is that actually true? If you look at any great master, I mean, they meditate. You know, they practice. You know, they say. I'm going to surrender until my very last breath. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I think it's the very reason why there's so many, so many people, you know, they let arrogance or pride or, you know, some sex scandal or something get the best of them is because they aren't practicing. They aren't continuing to surrender. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I, I've used this quote before, but there was a, I, I think you were there when I, was interviewing Unmani at the Sand Conference, and there's a quote from, I think, Padma Sambhava, which is, even though my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as the gra a grain of barley flour. Yeah. So there's this sort of need to kind of perfect impeccability you know, to, in one's life as a human being, irrespective of, or, uh, or perhaps on the foundation of, the vastness of awareness that one may have opened to. Yeah, yeah. If you want to be an ac accurate reflection of your divinity, that's absolutely true. Mm. We'll get more and more into that as we go along. So, yeah. um, so then the second awakening, the first involved lemonade. Yeah, yeah. So that was beautiful. So, um, yeah, the first one was basically the sense that I cannot control life. You know, I, my egoic nature, is not in control. And it was just opening to just this huge sense of, okay, God, you win, you're the boss, you show me the way. And so that was the first one. And it was, um, you know, after that moment, I can say that my life was just, was radically changed. And so then my, my life was still messy. Like I said, I was going through a divorce. I had all kinds of things to clean up in my life. And, and um, it was actually on my way to see Adya for the first time. I was driving up and over this uh, mountain pass, Wolf, Wolf Creek Mountain in, oh, yeah. in uh, Colorado. And I've been through that. Huge, yeah, huge mountain pass. And I started to go over it. And again, I started to have the, a similar experience as I had before. As I, I just started crying. You know, just like, I just felt like just chunks of my ego, like during this time, were just coming forward. And I would just start crying and just like laughing all at once. And mm. I was going down the mountain. And then I, you know, was driving more and just more of this was being released and released. Then I came into the, um, the San Luis Valley, which is just this incredible valley in Colorado. It's huge, it's open, it's vast. And all of a sudden my consciousness just blew out of my being and just, it, it seemed to get as big as, say, the universe. It's like an experience of huge, vast, conscious, conscious, uh, I'm sorry, cosmic consciousness. Mm. It was so huge, so vast, it was just, undescribable how how open it felt and I think I had some question that's something I was struggling with in my life and I just kind of asked to God and I just heard this word just surrender and I just said okay and just <laughs> it opened more it's like unbelievable how open you know we can we can become and so then I, I drove up and I saw Adya and um, I think the next day and I was talking to him and I said 
know, I was d describing to him my experience, and he was like, basically, that's great. You know, <laughs> and he said, he said, what's here right now? You know, because I was, I was saying, well, how do I keep it that huge and that open, say, forever? You know, because, of course, that, that experience just kind of came back a little bit. And, um, you know, he was like, yeah, let's forget about that. And he said, you know, just, he's like, you know, he's like, basically tell me, you know, what's here right now? I said, oh, there's a quiet here. He said, okay. I said, there, there's a silence here and there's a sense of aliveness. And he said, okay, good. Just be with that. Just be with that. You know, and, and that's the invitation is, can we not be with these huge experiences? And, and these experiences, I should say, they didn't really end, you know, you know, these huge awakenings, they, it's not that they end, but just in a real practical sense is what's here in every single moment. You know, like if we truly want to live in freedom, you know, we have to be willing, you know, just to rest into what's here. And so in every moment, there's a spaciousness here, there's a quietness here, you know, there's a vastness, there's a sense of peace, and there's a sense of this awake, aware, aliveness. And so the invitation is, is can we be with this? You know, can we be with this? And so that's, you know, been my, you know, spiritual practice, I guess. You know, if I say I have one, just an ongoing thing of just, oh, yes, it's, it's quiet, it's awake, you know, it's silence. There's space here, there's space for everything. And so if the ego comes forward and there's trouble that comes forward in the mind, there's always room and there's always space for it. And you'll always be free in a transcendent way, if you just identify with that. It doesn't mean your life gets cleaned up, it doesn't mean everything gets worked out, but we can. there's always freedom, like we're always walking around in freedom. And so for it to, to stabilize, we can't just live in that huge place that's kind of blown out of body and you know all that thing, but just to live in this, this, this quiet, awake sense that, oh yes, there's always space here, there's always room here, there's always freedom here. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we acclimate, you know. I mean, we integrate. Yeah. We acclimate. If if you could somehow step back to where you were at 20, 20 or twenty five years ago, all of a sudden, <clears throat> you know, even though you might have been you know relatively okay then, you might you, you would probably find it agonizing, you know, un, unbearable. Absolutely. The, the sudden contrast, and and conversely, if you were you know twenty five years ago to step into where you are now, even though it seems kind of normal and you're just kind of cruising along, that you know the contrast would be vast and overwhelming, and you know more yeah. than more than you could handle. So we just kind of keep mm. taking a bite and digesting, taking a bite and digesting, yeah. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So what was the heart opening? You mentioned two two transcendent ones and a heart opening. Heart awakening. Okay, and so the the heart awakening comes. You know, again, I went and I saw. Um, I was talking to Adya, and, and I said, you know, this was when I was, you know, it's kind of living in that transcendent space. I was during that time. I just would go see Adya anywhere he was. I was just chasing him down. But, mm. you know, I said, hey, there's this vastness, whatever. There's this huge sense of freedom, and I see that my ego keeps coming forward. You know, and a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people think that if I realize the transcendent, then my ego is wiped clean and it's free and there's no more ego anymore. And so, you know, I just said, well, why don't, why don't you go into that? Like, why don't you open into that? And that's the same instruction that my teacher David gave me again and again was, can you open into that? Can you open to pain? Can you open to your humanity? Can you include your humanity? And so... So the, the transcendent awakening, I shouldn't say it's absent of feeling, but the feeling of it is, you know, a feeling of like being living in a heaven world. The mm. heart awakening, you know, that comes through being willing to feel and experience everything in life, all of your humanity, all of life, and not to have a sense of division. Because one of the big things, and you know, this also goes along with that delusion, that I spoke about with the transcendent awakening is the transcendent awakening gives you the sense that I'm awake and the rest of the world is asleep. And you'll see a lot of people walk around with this like, I am awake, I am the awakened one, there's nobody <laughs> here, and all, you know, all that jive, you know, it's just like I know, a bunch I, of. I find it very aggravating to interview those people. I, yeah. I've done a number of them and I don't know, I just never quite see eye to eye. 
Yeah, and it's well, and it's again, it's it's hard to see out of that. But if you have a good teacher, a good teacher will harass you and say, you know, well, what's that? You know, normally they point to somewhere below your throat. Mm. You know, normally in your chest, excuse, or or in your belly. You know, is where we carry all kinds of unconscious stuff. And so, you know, I've, it's hard for me not to be honest. It's hard for me to be like, I am the awakened one. You know, I know <laughs> I'm having this huge awakening and I have a big fat ego, you know, that's coming forward. And so the invitation is, is can you open to that? Can you experience it? Can you be willing to, to meet your pain, to meet your humanity with a total sense of love? Hmm. You know, and it's not from you like me, the ego is meeting my self with love but more in the sense of just like opening to the goodness and purity of your own heart and allowing that heart space to embrace your very own pain mm. to embrace your very own pain um, when i was listening to you, I, I heard that you use the word willing a lot are you the willingness to do this and the invitation yeah. is to do that and it kind yeah. of made me feel like you'd probably hung around uh, gangaji and eli jackson bear quite a bit because they, they yeah. both often use those phrases um, yeah and I, I guess the sticking point with, with me on, on that is, um, you know, we were saying earlier about how there's a lot of stuff that's just buried and it's tenacious and it's just not all going to come out at once. And so, uh, well, elaborate a little bit on willingness. I mean, a person might say, yeah, I am willing, but nothing's happening or it feels like there's so much still stuck there and let's get mm -hmm. on with it. You know, I, how, yeah. do, how do I kind of unearth everything yeah. uh, and, and heal it without overindulging in emotionality? Yeah. So the willingness is to connect with your, with your innate divinity, mm -hmm. a willingness to connect with the beauty and the divinity of your own heart and the willingness to feel pain. See, most people don't want to feel pain. They say, oh, I don't like the way this feels, and so I'm just going to go back into the transcendent realm. And you'll see a lot of people, even great teachers, I see, I, I notice them, you know, just hiding out in the transcendent realm and being unwilling to feel and to experience their own humanity. And when we do that, of course, then those shadow aspects come forward, you know, into our lives. I mean, the, the reason I, I shouldn't say great teachers do that, everyone does this myself included and that's the way I've discovered it is in the sense that that our ego has all these programs and again if we're going to be free of ego it, you know we have to be free of those programs so one of, one of the biggest programs the egoic nature has is to seek pleasure and avoid pain at all costs and so there has to be a willingness to feel pain and this is one of the gifts that my teacher David gave me is, is he said go into the pain see what's there see pain as a mystery but what our egoic nature is it, it does it says i know what pain is it's bad and therefore i'm going to avoid it ignore it repress it transcend it do anything but feel it all right let's you know, say but, somebody's listening to this and they say all right i'm willing yeah. to feel pain i want to feel it i yeah. want to work through it uh -huh. uh, how do they actually do it i mean you bring your awareness into it in a meditative state? I mean, oh, are you absolutely. driving down the freeway while you're eating dinner with your family? I, I do. Mean, I do it all. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, starting a meditative state is great because you have all your attention you don't have a lot of and awareness. You don't have a lot of distractions. But if you just notice, if you just come into pain, if you just notice your mind, the first thing it wants to do is it wants to jump back out of it. Mm -hmm. And it wants to go into the story. This pain shouldn't be here. How do I get rid of it? Yeah. You know, and then like when I work with individuals or when I work with myself, that's that's the game that our mind plays. But if we are going to live in a way that's greater than our own mind, we have to be willing to feel. We have to be willing to experience. You know, just like say when you get up in the morning, you want to experience bliss. So you sit down and meditate. You say your mantra eight million times. You know, you kind of, you know, step, you know, rise through the crown chakra and go out into the transcendent space. That's one form of meditation. Mm -hmm. A different form of meditation is can I open fully to pain? Can I feel it? Can I experience it? Can I meet it totally with love? You know, the same way, you know, you meet a child, like a like my little baby, if she's crying, you know, you, you get down on your knees and you pick her up and you and you hold her close to your heart. 
you know, and you, you, be will, you allow her to scream and have her fit, and you just gently hold the space for her, and then soon she begins to calm down. And so the same is true with us meeting our pain. You know, can we open to it? Can we listen to it without believing the story? And here's the, the big trick is, is to not believe the story of the pain, but to feel the pain, to experience it directly. As an actual physical sensation? Oh, yes, absolutely. It has to be a physical sensation. If you look at, you know, if, we, if we're going to talk, say, psychology now, but, mm -hmm. you know, if you have emotional pain within you, the way emotional pain is healed is through feeling it, mm -hmm. allowing it to release, and then it's gone. Yeah, but so if you don't feel and experience pain, it stays repressed within you, and then it comes out of you in some, say, neurotic way. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you might be sitting in meditation, let's say. Uh, I, I, the reason we mention meditation is that a lot of people, it seems like a lot of humanity is really busy trying to distract themselves from feeling anything. You know, there's sure. got to go to the next movie, got to camp out on the sidewalk in front of the Apple store to get the next iPhone. And, you know, it's just sure. all, all kinds of stuff that people are always doing. And, you know, what you're advocating is seems a bit more introspective and a, a free and probably requires a, a little bit of a freeing up from from the usual distractions yeah. and um, so you're saying let's say one is sitting in a meditative state and feeling some ache in the heart or something like that yeah. and who knows what that ache is actually associated with in terms of any events that ever happened but and one may attach a meaning to it one might think oh I really want to be with this person or such and so and so really wronged me 10 years ago or something but what you're saying is don't get caught up in those meanings uh, just keep coming back to the physical sensation and dwell mm -hmm. on it, dwell, be with it. Yeah, and you want to be with it fully. Mm -hmm. You're going to be willing to be with it fully and completely. As much and, as you can. As much as you can. Um, right. I would say you want to join with it 100%. Mm -hmm. 100%. You know, it's like if if I was in pain... You know, and I went to one of my teachers, say David, or went to Adya or something. You know, I would sit there with them, and there would just be this sense of it's okay to fully feel and to fully experience this. It's like 100% to become one with the feeling. When you become one with the feeling, you'll find that it will, your heart will break open, and the experience will rush through your body. It will feel like, I mean, it may feel crazy. You know, if it's, say, the first time you're doing it, it will feel absolutely overwhelming, perhaps even terrifying. You know, oftentimes when I walk people through this, they turn pale. But as you breathe through it, what you discover is a hugeness of love and a hugeness of, of it's like an indestructibility, mm. that who and what I am is greater than any experience in my body, greater than any experience of pain, it's because if we're going to be free, we have to be free of fear of pain, fear of feeling. And, and also, I'll say this, this will, this will sound probably crazy to most people, but if you experience pain just in the most intimate way, you become totally intimate with pain, what you'll discover is, is absolute bliss there, mm -hmm. absolute energy. And it's, it's amazing. It is quite amazing to be like, oh, my God, I was so terrified of this thing. And now look at it. As I open to it, as I join with it, as I become one with it, as this energy moves through my body, I discover something quite profound, much more profound than what I thought it was before. Are you just mainly referring to emotional pain here? Uh, or would you also say that to a, a burn victim or a cancer patient or something? Oh, I don't, I don't think I could, could say it to a a burn victim or a, or a cancer patient, like if it's true physical pain, there is pain that is just true physical pain. I think it's possible. And, you know, for a while I lived with um, oh, yeah, chronic, back pain, yeah. chronic back pain. And for me, that, that chronic back pain ended up being kundalini energy. But, you know, if you look at, say, pain, you know, if you, if you go into any pain, even if it's a physical pain, you can go into it and experience it on the level of bliss if you fully and totally open to it. But I'm not going to be, you know, that arrogant to say that you could live that way, say, forever. No. You know, true. I mean, there is, true. you know, if someone drew, you know, 
I'm, I've been a carpenter before, and if I hit my hand with a hammer, <laughs> it's going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to absolutely hurt. So I want to be clear, you know, to, to anyone who's, you know, in that kind of pain that, yeah, of course, you know, we have bodies and we have physical pain, you know, but pain can teach us so much. We have such yeah. an aversion to pain, you know, especially, I don't know if especially spiritual people, but I know a lot of spiritual people, maybe all of humanity, is just trying to escape pain. Is, is trying to escape pain. And, you know, in this world, we're going to experience pain. And this invitation is, is, can we open to it fully and completely and to see if it actually is what our mind is telling us it is? So would you say that the reason that you might um, enter into bliss having fully felt your pain is that that pain you were feeling was actually the thing that was blocking you and by fully feeling it you you remove the block and as soon as the block is removed there's a naturally an upsurge of of bliss that was kind of like bottled up and waiting to be experienced so so i would say that's true but also if you experience any energy you know fully and completely at its core its very nature its very essence is bliss you know, so say like, you know, I'm not that good with all the um, quantum physics kind of stuff, you know, but I don't have that kind of mind. But if you experience any, any energy in its most fundamental essence, I imagine it's bliss. Yeah, I don't know about in a quantum physicist would agree with that, but it is certainly the, the traditional teachings do. And is that saying in contact with Brahman is infinite joy. Sure. And, uh, I once heard a lecture in which the teacher said, said bliss itself isn't blissful, but it's the contact with it, the, the, the kind of the interface between our, our, sure. our human experience and the field of sat chit ananda or bliss yeah. that, that creates waves. Exactly, and that's what I meant, that, that, fe that field that you're speaking about. It's like this whole world, you know, is like this field of energy, and that energy is God. And of course, you experience God, like you said, <laughs> it's yeah. going to be blissful. Yeah. Um, okay, I think I wrapped up that question. Oh, I know what I had a question kicking around, was, which was that um, how successful do you think people would, would be just listening to this interview to, you know, in, in sitting down and doing what we're saying, experiencing the, the bottled up pain and, and kind of healing and resolving it, or how important will it be for most people to have a facilitator or a teacher to help, oh, I think help, it's help them through the process? It's absolutely helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I learned, just through sitting with David, you know, sitting with Aja, sitting with John Burney. Right. You know, it's just, you know, just being willing to have someone there to hold that space for you. In a sense, if you go to a good therapist, you know, um, I know therapist is a dirty word for a lot of people. But if you go to a good therapist, what they're doing, you know, hopefully, is holding a space of love for you. Mm. And in a sense, like any mother knows this, we all know how to do this. We do it with our children. We do it with our, our dogs. We do it with our partners. You know, but we don't always do it with ourselves. Mm. You know, it's just like being willing to hold the space while part of you is screaming and shouting and has a big story. Just meeting it with love and also meeting it with the, that wisdom of the parent who knows okay, I'm not really going to listen to the big story of my five-year-old who's having a tantrum because they don't get a cookie. You know, it's like you hold the space of love, you don't listen to the story, the energy moves through them, and then they're left, you know, in this sense of, oh, you know, I am actually okay. Like I'm in a more fundamental sense, in a more true sense. I don't have to believe my mind. I can calm down and come into this deeper place and realize, you know, that's how we all grow up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, of course, these days, some of these teachers, like Adya, of course, is very, are very popular, and you can go to, on a retreat with them with 300 people there, but, yeah. but there's not going to be a good chance of you sitting in the seat and, and interacting with them personally. Um, yeah. But do you, yeah, and that's, that's, you why it's, that? yeah. that's why it's helpful, you know, to find a teacher, you know, like, you know, that's what I do, say, you know, professionally, is I, I sit with people and Right. You know, we do this, we do this type of work, but there's, I think there's a lot of people out there doing it, but it's, you know, finding someone 
you know, one who's done the work on themselves. Because when you've done the work on yourself, you feel confident in the sense that it's going to be okay. You know, a lot of therapists actually come to me for training. They say, well, how do you hold a space like that? Well, the first thing is you have to not be afraid of feeling. You can't be afraid of losing control. You have to walk through those doors first. And then you realize that, oh, it's actually okay. I didn't actually go crazy. You know, I'm actually, you know, quite here, quite incredible, quite strong, quite vibrant, quite alive. Mm. But again, this isn't an egoic thing. It's some it's a it's a trust thing. It's you trusting in your nature that you're good, that nothing can destroy you. And as you do, God shows you that. So um, on the other side of your transcendent awakening, you know, there was a lot of vastness and and kind of detachment, I suppose, and and that kind of thing characterizing your life. And uh, then you went through this more of a heart awakening. So on the other side of your heart awakening, how was your everyday life experienced? Yeah, so so an overwhelming intimacy with all of life. Pretty much all the time, more or less. All the time, yeah. yeah. To the point of it being ridiculous. I think when we first start having, well, you know, the time that's close to the awakening is a little bit of a ridiculous period in life mm -hmm. because in a sense, most of us become you know, somewhat or mostly non-functional. You know, so for me, I was walking around just with such bliss, such just overwhelming ecstasy just pouring out of my body. And I mean, I remember I was walking across a, a sidewalk or a parking lot. And I saw gum stuck on the ground and it was just like overwhelming love was just pouring out of some dirty piece of gum, huh. you know. But it's this, this sense of just being overwhelmed by love and unity and intimacy with all of life. And, and a very interesting thing comes through, through being willing to feel and experience pain, through also being willing to be open and in love with all of life. Like the part about being open and all in love with all of life, that's kind of a grace. That's just easy. You know, it's just like when you're flooded with, with bliss and openness, it's like it's easy to fall in love with a doorknob, you know, or a wall or the sky or you know, even someone being angry. I mean, I can even remember someone coming at me being really angry and just being like, my God, they're so beautiful, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so that's easy. But from this willingness to meet pain fully and just to experience it fully without any fear there, you know, what, the funny thing happens in your mind is, is a true non-duality begins to happen in your mind in the sense that there begins, you begin to lose the sense of division between between opposites, if that makes sense. Because the big the big division that we all have is this feels good and this doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But when you're willing to open-heartedly feel and experience everything without reservation, that part of your mind begins to die, it begins to dissolve, it begins to disappear. And life becomes very strange then because in a sense, you begin to experience things you know, that sometimes were painful or terrible and you don't you don't see them from a place of judgment, hmm. if that makes sense. It does. Would it also be true to say, in your experience, that um, not only the distinction or division between relative pairs of opposites became less uh, contrasting, but the distinction between the, the transcendent silence and the entire relative creation, uh, in your experience, became less, and is still becoming less and less contrasting. So that there's there's really not so much uh, gulf between the two. Oh, absolutely. I, I thought about it differently than how you just described it, but what I felt is that the transcendent descended into the being and just was experienced as just spaciousness everywhere in everyday life. And there wasn't any more this sense of I'm awake and the rest of the world's not awake. There was just this sense of all of life is awake, all of life is alive and vibrating, with beauty and divinity. You know, the, the shadow side of the transcendent realm is, is kind of this awake aloofness. I'm the awakened one and everyone else is just mere whatever mortals or whatever they are. You know, they're Scum they're living the in earth. They're, they're <laughs> living in their egoic nature or, or whatever it is. Yeah. There's this very bizarre dissolving of a feeling that you are at all different from anything else on earth. You know, so like to see like, like it's funny because I'll see as much beauty, say, in 
you know, somebody terrible, you know, like if I visited, you know, someone in jail or something or, you know, someone in a fight as in, you know, another being, you know, who's, you know, an awakened whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and so those divisions, they dissolve and it becomes really bizarre to live in a way without out divisions. And yet, at the, on the other hand, you know, you probably have a, a much greater affinity with your daughter than with some kid that you might see in the shopping mall. Yeah. You know, uh, and with your, by the same token, with your wife. So despite, sure. despite this kind of more universal perspective, yeah. we still have our favorites, don't we? We, d we definitely still have our favorites. Yeah, yeah. I and I think, um, you know, our, our humanity helps to keep us in check because we can become a little, we can be, we can get a little bit out there you know, when the, when the heart really awakens that way, if we're not careful. And so, yeah. And so, and Rick, that's, that's good that you brought that up because it's, you know, this relates back to what you're saying about spiritual practice. It's always good to carry, you know, in your back pocket, a little bit of discernment. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's good not to, okay, I'm going to give all my money to this hitchhiker I just picked up, you know, because <laughs> I'm totally in love with him and he's having a really hard time. You know, it's like, well, Maybe you pick them up and give them a ride, but, you know, you, you don't, you know, give them all of yourself. You know what I mean? Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. So you always want to, you always want to have, you know, some discernment and to have those spiritual practices to keep yourself in check. And I think, you know, one of the things that I like to do is to look at the shadows of all these experiences, because like I said, the reason I learned them is because I found them coming up in my own life is, you know, if you're not careful you know, with when your heart awakens, you know, this is where you see people, you know, just, you know, they go on meditation retreats or yoga retreats, and then all of a sudden everyone's sleeping with each other, or everyone's in these gooey, you know, you know, hug fests or whatever it is, you know what I mean? It's like, you need to be really careful that you don't get yourself in a lot of trouble. You have to have some discipline, or you're going to make a mess out of your life and, the, and mess out of someone else's life. Yeah. There's an interesting quote from the Brihadaranika Upanishad, which uh, it's kind of repetitive, but it says, it is not for the sake of the husband, my dear, that he is loved, but for, the sa for one's own sake that he is loved. It is not for the sake of the wife, my dear, that she is loved, but for one's own sake that she is loved. And then it goes on and on, enumerates a lot of things that, you know, we, we may love, but it's not for the sake of those things, it's for one's own sake. And then the conclusion is, the self should be realized, should be heard of, reflected on, and meditated upon. By the realization of the self, my dear, through hearing, reflection, and meditation, all this is known. And the reason I bring it up is that um, I think there's a tendency to project. You know, like you said on the meditation retreat, one is there, yeah. getting full of energy and shakti, and every all of a sudden, everybody you fall in love with everybody. Everybody looks beautiful. You know, you start mm -hmm. having infatuations with all kinds of people uh, yeah. so you know the question the question is well is that really about them or is it really about your own heart that's going through some kind of a stirring or awakening mm -hmm. and yet you know you still love your wife more than exactly more than that other person that you might pass on the street or something so it's, it's a funny thing because there's there's this, this sort of projection thing and yet some people in terms of our relationship with them are intrinsically more lovable sure no no absolutely and it's it's i have a very funny relationship with my my wife in a sense that because i have such little memory and um my heart seems to be open you know every day i tell her my god i look at you and i just i just fall in love with you again you know and she, sometimes she asks me don't you get bored of me and and well, if you don't have a memory, it's hard to get bored. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. And just, you know, just when I see her through my heart, it's just like, oh, my God, I just I fall in love with you. And it's um, That's really it's just so wonderful. Yeah. And the yeah, same with the, my kids, like you know, even freshness my, every day of freshness. Yeah. So a fresh. It's, it's not it's very nice. You know, even with my 13 year old, who's mm -hmm. who um, she gives me a hard time because she's a teenager. It's like, oh, you know, I look at her and I'm like, oh, my God, you're so beautiful, uh -huh. you know. Yeah, it's kind of like what Ronald Reagan said about coming down with Alzheimer's. You can laugh at the same jokes over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can, it can be like that. I'm always asking my wife, oh, is that is that a new dress? Is that a new shirt? And she says, no, I've had this. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, OK, good. It looks good on you. you know? um, 
we can edit this out if it's too personal, but when we went out to dinner or that group in, uh, at the SAN conference, you, sure. you, you told this story about how you were engaged to somebody, and then this woman walked in the door and you fell in love with her. And, yeah. uh, and then I guess that's the one you ended up marrying, and it was probably yeah. a bit of a sticky wicket to un get unengaged to the other one. Um, yeah. So you know, and I was just kind of overhearing the conversation as you were telling it, but in, in a way I, w I was wondering whether you were like that person on the spiritual retreat who just kind of falls in love with everybody, or what was it about this woman walking in the door that made you realize, whoa, this is, this is it, yeah. this, this is the one I really love. And, was this all kind of post heart awakening that you were functioning in this way? Um, yeah, so it, you know, I want to just clarify the story. It was in a sense I was I wasn't engaged uh, to the person, but I was going to get married. I, see. Uh, I thought I thought I was going to get married to them, but yeah, then my um, my wife walked in the door, and I, when I saw her, I said, "Oh boy, you know, there's something really here." You know, and and yeah, I ended up falling in love with her, and I just I just resonated in a deeper way with her, yeah. and it was um, it was quite profound. You know, it was quite profound, and so you and, didn't necessarily have a track record of love at first sight. This was sort of a unique, profound. No, no, experience this was a this was a this was a unique thing. Yeah, when I saw my wife, is I fell in love with her right away, mm -hmm. and then I knew that my relationship before, you know, that it was over, mm. that it was over. And um, no, it wasn't the sense of, of just because my heart was, was awake that that's, I was just falling in love with everything. I was falling in love with everything, but I just knew in a very deep way yeah. that, oh yes, like this is, this is who I'm supposed to be with. And I imagine the way your life tends to flow is that you know you're quite appreciative of a divine orchestration that's happening all the time. You know, so sure. you know your current wife didn't just walk in that door arbitrarily. Just no, God, but, God brought her to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, God, and I think you know God does that with all of our life. Is God brings us things, and so in that moment, God brought me something quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. But in other moments, you know, God brings us quite terrible things. You know, that's something that I talk with people every day with is God brings us terrible things and terrible things. They also help us to awaken, you know, oftentimes much more so than good things. Yeah. Well, it's you hard know? for some people to even believe in God, you know, because of uh, the things that happen to people. Um, well, we, you know, we have this. Of, how could there be an intelligent, compassionate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, presence gui guiding the universe if such horrendous things mm -hmm. are happening to people all the time? And that's and that can be true when we look at God from the perspective of our egoic nature, mm. even say from a rational nature. But God is beyond reason. God is beyond rationale. And honestly, you know, God does uh, things to make us grow because God is an evolutionary force. Evolution, you know, obviously didn't care about how the dinosaurs felt. Evolution had a greater thing in mind. Yeah. Now, of course, to be a dinosaur, that was a painful experience, whatever it was, well, it was that a, happened. It was an asteroid a hitting the Yucatan. And, you know. Yeah, it was a painful experience for, you know, I couldn't imagine being a dinosaur and, you know, being a father and having a little baby and watching the baby starve to death or die all at once or burn up mm -hmm. in a fiery hell or whatever it was. But the thing, about, you know, the thing about God is we have to be careful not to interpret God through the lens of our mind. You know, we have to be willing to meet God through God, and then it begins to make much more sense. Yeah. You know, and that's a, that's a, something very difficult. You know, someone has to be willing and ready for that perspective. You know, so it's, it's a, this is not a perspective we can force upon someone. You know, someone comes into my office with cancer. I don't say, oh, you have cancer because God is trying to teach you. <laughs> You know, we don't talk in that way. That would be to be quite rude and unsensitive. But know? in the back of your mind, you believe that, don't you? In the back of it's not a belief. It's in the back it's of my the mind. Way I understand the I, universe. To work. I know, and I just, and I know through my own experience of the the biggest hell and pain that I've been through, is what has served to wake me up. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that not only let's say spiritual aspirants can learn from relationship breakups and financial problems and all the other things that happen in life uh, uh, if, if they're open to and appreciative of the, the sort of divine hand guiding things. But you're saying that, you know, the kind of stuff we watch on the evening news 
you know, the plane crashes, the fires, the, tra the, the various you know, wars and tragedies, that in the big picture of things, those two are, you know, there, there's an evolutionary kind of um, momentum or force governing even those things for those people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah this, this is God's world. Mm -hmm. I mean, we think it's our world, but this is God's world. It's God's play. It's God's evolution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I know it is hard for people to swallow, uh, but... It's, it's hard for me to swallow sometimes, too, when I think about war. I, I have an older brother, and he goes to war. When I think about that, and, you know, you see a little baby in, in the hospital with cancer, or, you know, a friend of mine who has a baby, and, you know, goes to the hospital. It's like, it's, it's, it breaks your heart, you know, but the invitation is, is can you allow it to break your heart open? You know, and just to, to, to be willing to see it and to experience from a vast place and not just from the perspective of our mind. Of course, from our mind, it feels like hell. And in a sense, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is a, a dark planet or a dark world or whatever. And I look at it more, this is an evolutionary planet. You know, that's what Sri Aurobindo taught is that this is a world of evolution. And in evolution, you know, whatever we're evolving into we're still in the stage where people kill you know kill things to eat you know kill each other you know people rape you know people say mean things you know i even say mean things <laughs> you know it's like we can see all these things within ourselves you know we can see them all within our own mind and our own nature and so we are we are one with evolution and so these are the things that are happening at this time on our planet, now maybe in a thousand years or a hundred years, I don't know, it will be radically different. But, you know, at this point in time, yes, these things happen. Yeah. So uh, we'll move on to the next point. But um, maybe to wrap this one up, I would suggest to people that even though this sounds kind of philosophical, it, it, it is something to ponder and, and that you are speaking, we're both speaking from experience, not just kind of philosophical niceties that make 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 us make the world make more sense to us but yeah. there, there's a sort of a cognitive appreciation of the things that this of the of the fact that this is the way things are actually un, unfolding and being conducted yeah yeah absolutely yeah and maybe beyond cognitive but it's a, like an intuitive experiential thing yeah. that we experience through our heart of just that's even, kind of what i mean by cognitive intuitive oh, experiential yeah yeah, absolutely. Like when I experience, you know, say, you know, something terrible I see on the news through my heart, you know, I can see God's hand in it. I can feel God's hand in it. When I feel, you know, total pain or some nightmare come through my life, it's like, oh, yes, I see and experience God's hand in it. Yeah. <laughs> my mind doesn't like it. You know, my mind says, no, I do not want this to happen, you know. But, you know, in a huge way, if we can truly be open, we can say, okay, all right, God, you know, what do you have to show me here? And oftentimes we have to be walked through the dark, you know, to discover the light. And, you know, that's a, it's a painful experience. I, I had this really bizarre experience. It was last year I went to a, um, the, I think it's called a cancer ward, just a part of the hospital or a chemo ward where everyone was getting chemo. And I, I walked into this room and it was a really big room and and you know there must have been 20 or 30 people in there and um, I've always been kind of scared of hospitals and never liked the feelings or vibrations there but I walked into this room and there was all these people and they were hooked up to the chemo machines and or the drip or whatever it was and um, I felt like I was in a heaven world hmm. there was just so much love and so much grace and so much I, I was like my god it was such an amazing thing for me just to walk into this. And here it was, as everyone, everyone there looked as if they were one step away from death. Mm. And yet it was just overwhelming, just overwhelmingly full of love and grace and beauty. Mm. And it was um, quite paradoxical to the mind because the mind would say, well, these people are dying. This is really sad. This is bad. You know, whatever the mind would say, we have to cure cancer or whatever. But the experience of it, you know, from the heart was was that this was this was heaven. Hmm. I bet you there are a lot of celestial beings there doing their thing yeah. in a scene like that. You know, just yeah. attending to people, guardian yeah. angels or whatever we want to call them. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, okay, so in terms of the awakenings that you have undergone, we've now gone through two transcendent ones and a heart one. And then you mentioned a, a hara one, which I presume is the kind of a Buddhist word for the gut. You know, Adi Shanti talks about head, heart, and gut. Um, is that what it is? And what was that? Yeah, so I'd say this is the most confusing one um, in the sense that it's a falling away of the personal will. And um, I'm just thinking about it um, or feeling into it kind of makes me go very blank and very quiet. So can you ask me a question about it? Yeah. Um, falling away of the personal will. So do you feel now that you have a personal will? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd say I'd be arrogant if I said uh, no. Um, yes, of, co of course, I have a personal will, uh, which arises. And, um, but also, it seems as if there's this greater force, you know, a greater sense of divinity mm -hmm. that moves through me as me. Do I live in that place in every moment? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, quite young and I can be quite immature sometimes. How old are you? I'm almost 40. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You're still a baby. Yeah, I'm still a baby. <laughs> And, and yeah, my egoic nature does come forward uh, from time to time, and there's all kinds of ways that I can grow. But at some point, you know, after the heart awakening, and, um, you know, actually after the heart awakening came the Kundalini awakening, but uh, um, the heart awakening is more of a sense of that who and what I am cannot be destroyed, mm. you know, in the deepest sense. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it feels very quiet, it feels very large, it feels, um, you know, like as if, if my life ended right now, that that would be totally fine, completely okay. It feels like a total completion, um, you know, an absolute strength, you know, an absolute quiet. Um, and it's, so in it's, terms of will, um, would you say it's a ratio thing where, you know, earlier, in, much earlier in your life, uh, you know, it was like 99% Craig, <laughs> you know, r trying to run the show and 1% and divine, you know, kind of hiding back there someplace. Mm -hmm. And the ratios started to shift as you did spiritual practice. And then this Hara awakening was a kind of a significant shift in terms of that ratio where, you know, just enough Craig to sort of you know, still live an individual life remained, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, the Brahman is the charioteer, to, to use a Sanskrit phrase translated. Yeah. Thing. That's, a, that's a thing they say, actually, is that the, the wholeness is running the show, driving the chariot anymore, not, not the individuality. Yeah, I would, I would actually say, so that, and also uh, another thing happened too, but let's, t let's talk about that. Let me make sure I can get this fully. Life became very impersonal, mm. like completely impersonal. And I went through this phase of where it just seemed that that everything was just, I don't really have words for it, but just completely, like there was no experience at all, <laughs> like none, like zero experience. Really? So and this went on for... Explain a, that. No, so you, let's say you're... I don't know, you're riding a bicycle down the street. There's no there's zero mm -hmm. experience. And how yeah. do, how do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. So so say before the experience, you know, transcendent is vast spaciousness, the heart experience is overwhelming intimacy with all of life. Mm -hmm. And so say the experience of uh of this awakening was complete silence. And it wasn't that there was like energy or bliss or anything. It was almost like total nothingness. But that nothingness is, you know, to use the Buddha's words, say pregnant with all potential. Hmm. And so that you know, is almost like a description of, say, nirvana of just no experience, like none. There's no me and another, and there's just. 
it's it's quite difficult to speak was, about. I'm was sorry. It, is it a sense, of or was it a sense of nothing ever happened? Like, like let's say you're, I don't know, at a concert or something. I don't know if you went to a concert during this phase, and you know you're seeing the concert, experiencing the concert, and yet in in a kind of a almost predominant sense, there is no concert. There's nothing going on here. It's all just silence. Is it kind of like that? No, I did. I don't know if I had it that experience. I'm mean, just using the concert as a case in point. Yeah, I'm not, sure. not trying so, to put words in your mouth, but you're having a hard time describing no, let me, it. So. Yeah, let me see. Um, it was like the it was like the this great non experience of everything. Hmm. It's quite bizarre of just say no experience. Like there is no experience, there is no other I'm not gonna say there's no one here. <laughs> I'm not gonna play that card, but um, it just felt like everything was just like wiped clean. How long did that last? Um, you know, it's it's interesting when you ask how long something lasts. I mean, I experience that right now. Mm -hmm. You know, if I just step into it. Yeah. Do I live in that place? No. But you know, it's like with all these things. You know, I can can go into different worlds, but at some point, it's almost like every experience imploded into that experience of yeah. just this non-experience of and um, that's very disorienting it's yeah. quite bizarre it's um because you know like your your ego doesn't know what to do with that like your mind doesn't know what to do with it it's just and in a sense it, it, there's nothing glorious or glamorous about it. No one would ever, no one could ever want that. And within that, I think just different parts of yourself begin to fall away. And I think with that, you know, I probably had a big, say, sense of memory, but also a sense of will fall away. Hmm. You know, and that's that sense of like, I remember, so say, looking from that perspective and you see something as terrible as, say, a tsunami come through and destroy you know a village in in japan and there's just this sense of right just like total quiet and total peace with it all i don't even know if peace is the right word but to say that sounds crazy and i you know i almost hesitate even saying it right now you know if anyone was in that experience or had their whole life wrecked and you know for me to sit and you know, to yeah. say, oh, yes, there's, it's just, that's peace. Well, and it's also a little bit easier to watch it on television than it would be to be in that village as a tsunami was starting to crash down on you and there were, you know, sure. cars tumbling in the water towards you and stuff. You might have oh, a sure, bit more of an sure. adrenaline reaction. Ab absolutely, but I could also say that all kinds of, you know, say painful things happened in my life and it was just like a sense of just... Yeah. And that... Um, yeah, it's it's nothing anyone could ever want. It's nothing anyone could ever desire. It's um, it's like free of want. It's free of desire. It's free of any sense of personal like I am having this experience. It's almost like you are the experience of it. If mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, did it make it difficult for you to function when this came on, like in terms of your job and stuff? Oh, yeah. So, Rick, through all these awakenings, I've had a lot of trouble functioning. <laughs> a lot of trouble functioning. It's been, um, you know, what I just said to me is I kept harassing him about it. He's like, he's like, yeah, it's very inconvenient for life. And, and it makes you live in a very different kind of way. Mm. You know, like you can't have everything you want or desire anymore. You can't chase after this or that. You just have to surrender to it and just be like, okay, like, <clears throat> excuse me, okay, this is, this is what's leading me. And if, you know, if you're around any great teacher, you'll, you'll just see that, that there's this other thing that leads them. And it's, it's not always convenient to what they want or to what they desire, say, in their, in their humanity. You know, it oftentimes takes us to places we don't actually want to go or could never want to go. You know, and so, yeah, it took my bank account, it took my house, it took my business, it took, um, yeah, my ability to work. Um, 
But you regain those things. You've got a bank yeah. account now and a house and a business and a wife Absolutely. and a kid and all that stuff. So Yeah, now, now I'm quite busy. Yeah. Um, but at the time, you know, I can remember different parts of my nature coming forward, you know, and just not knowing, you know, how I was going to make ends meet and, yeah. you know, different fears would come forward. And, you know, you have to have a sense of faith and a sense of trust. And also, you know, sometimes you just have to get up off your butt and go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, but like Eckhart Tolle, you know, I think they said he spent two years sitting on a park bench and yeah, I spent two years, you know, kind of laying, you know, in my backyard, just looking at a willow tree, <laughs> dancing in the wind. Of course, I had children too, so I had to get up and take care of them, cook dinner, run around town. But there was a lot of time where it was just spent just, you know, allowing these things to fall out of you and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we could probably so so in between the the heart awakening and say the hara was this kundalini awakening and oh okay you wrote them in a different order on the paper here i was thinking this the kundalini oh, okay. was coming last no no i'm i'm sorry yeah. but i just wanted to say with regard to the hara thing you know it would seem yeah. that sometimes the slate needs to be wiped clean before you can draw something new on it you know and um i don't know there's verses in the bible about losing your life so that you can gain it and all kinds of quotes like that and all yeah, kinds and all, of examples of people whose lives who just kind of totally fell apart but then from the ashes something much better got built yeah and i want to be crystal clear here rick so those sound beautiful and during the time you have this paradoxical experience of it being yes a totally perfect totally divine and also various parts of your egoic nature are coming forward oftentimes screaming mm -hmm. you know as you're wondering if you're going to end up on the street homeless you know, it's a it's yeah. a incredibly painful and paradoxically incredibly blissful experience at the same time. Yeah, and it's interesting because if you had been in a monastery or something when that happened, like my friend uh, Francis Bennett was, sure, then you know it might not have mattered that much because you're you don't need to really you can you know you'll be taken care of there. You, you're not responsible. Yeah, you, you for might a lot. miss you might miss the morning prayers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you're, you're taken care of, and that's the beauty of the, the monastery, you know, I mean, from one perspective, you know, that's the beauty of it, is, is it's there to take care of you. But as more and more people are, you know, are awakening in this way, and I, like I said, I work with a lot of people, mm -hmm. it it can be nerve-wracking, it can be confusing, it can be financially painful, it can, have, it can rip your heart out. Yeah. Um, but through this experience, that's where you come to this, ex to this, this non-dual reality of seeing that, that everything is everything is divine everything is god and and another interesting a very interesting thing happened during this stage was my personality my humanity like it imploded into my divinity hmm. so that there was no difference and i'm not saying that my personality was some great divine thing it was like my personality in its humanity you know, in its shortcomings, in its neurotic behavior, in its silliness, in its, you know, you know, distorted vision, that too totally became the experience of God. Hmm. And so to me, you know, a lot of people talk about the end of seeking and, the, you know, there's this end of seeking that happens when we experience a transcendent awakening. There's a different kind of end of, end of seeking that happens, you know, say within the horror awakening in the sense that our very humanity, you know, our very infallibility, or, you know, fallibility, fallibility. Yeah, excuse me there, fallibility becomes, becomes God. Mm. And you're like, oh, wow, like, even when I get angry or sad or hurting or fall on my knees, that too is the greatest experience of God. And th this is when I've had a very difficult time conveying to anyone, it, it can sound quite arrogant, or like, how could that be possible? Do you know what I mean? Depending on how you interpret the words. Well, if you think of God, if you understand or God to be omnipresent and you know per, all pervading, then yeah. how, how can all these things you just enumerated not be? Yeah. You know. Yeah, and and there becomes this this funny thing. It's like a total acceptance of your humanity, not, you know, your best humanity, but say your worst <laughs> of your humanity, like a total acceptance of it, like, oh, wow, like, 
yeah, like that's God too. And and I think we have to be real careful there because when we walk in, because when we totally accept it, you know, a shadow of totally accepting something is giving it full permission to act. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think that's how like a lot of teachers they who work all the way through this, you know, and then they have they still are left with these egoic parts and they totally accept them and then they, they see that there's no division between it and God and then they give themselves permission to act from that space. We have to be really careful and I just noticed that in myself, you know, I, I don't have a big teaching community or anything where I could have power abuses or anything like that, but I just saw it in my life where I was kind of like letting myself get away with things that is like, oh, you shouldn't let yourself go down those roads. Do you know what I mean? And so it's this yeah. bizarre experience of total acceptance and total divinity in my just regular everyday humanity uh -huh. and just, you know, such a love for it. You mentioned the word discrimination earlier, and it's, it would seem yeah. here that, you know, that term applies again where, you know, through all these unfoldings, you're, you're never off the hook in terms of needing to be discriminating and uh, you know, discerning as to what you're doing and, and what's yeah. going on. You know, and those who lose that uh, discernment or discrimination get into trouble. Get, yeah, get into a lot of trouble. It's, it's amazing the amount of trouble that can happen there. I was mm -hmm. um, really following the, uh, the teachings of one particular teacher, and boy, did he go off the deep end of it. And, um, you know, it's heart-wrenching to see what happened to his life and his community. And, you know, it happens all the time. And yeah. I think it's good. So, so you have to have your discernment, but also it's helpful to have a couple good friends around it's helpful to have a wife you know <laughs> or yeah. someone to be like hey you're being a jackass you know or kids or you know or teachers you know or friends who can speak up to you and say hey like you know you're out of alignment here and you need to put yourself in check it seems to me that as long as we're in human form you know we can we can really fall on our face and make make a mess of things and so that's true but also it's true that as long as we're in human form, we're going to be growing, we're going to be evolving because we're one with evolution. And so these things are supposed to come forward within us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're supposed to because we're one with the force of evolution itself. And so, so these things are going to grow through us as us. Do you know what I did? Did that make sense? Yeah, it did. Um... To, to think that we're going to get to some great, vast, non-dual state where we're untouchable, that's to deny half of God. Yeah. You know, the dynamic aspect of God. And to me, that is a huge mistake that most of us make. It's a mistake I've made before, too, in my beginning search for enlightenment was that, oh, I'm going to get to some place where there's going to be complete unmovability and nothing can touch me. I'll be totally free of whatever. But, I mean, come on, you know, it's like, <laughs> I had to be real honest, like, oh, yeah, that's, maybe in heaven, we can, we can sit on our lion throne, but as long as we're on earth, we are one with evolution, and our mind, it's like, it, our mind is the same mind of, say, everyone on the planet, to some degree. Do you know what I mean? Because we're one with, you know, say, consciousness, or one with evolution. Yeah, I have debates about this sometimes with some friends who some of whom feel that you know you, they have reached a stage or that one reaches a stage in which you can you're pretty much done and anything after that is <laughs> is negligible you know, in in terms of development uh but i don't know maybe maybe i'll agree with them at some point but it's, it seems to me that it's just this as long as you're breathing there is you know plenty of opportunity for further refinement because because we're one with evolution we'll always be growing as long as we're in form a form of any kind on this planet in this world yeah now if we move on to say whatever the realm of the buddha and that realm where you know you go and you never incarnate again or whatever happens there yeah maybe you just stay there forever and you experience that half of god but if we're in this if we are in this realm this realm is a realm of evolution, and there is no way you can outrun evolution. It is our nature. 
It's God's nature. It's there's no escape from it. In fact, you know, a deep form of surrender is can we surrender to that and and give in to that impulse and allow it to grow through us as us into something greater. Yeah. Even speaking of other realms, I mean, you read Vedic stories about these devas and and whatnot that are still, you know, climbing up the ladder, so to speak, in terms of yeah. greater and greater possibility. In fact, in fact, there's this understanding that they're like, in in that tradition, that they're like sixteen kalas, they call them, which are supposed to be like stages of evolution, and supposedly human beings occupy the fourth through the eighth. And so even if you're like the most enlightened person to ever walk the earth, you're, you're still at maybe call it eight. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's other possibilities when you leave this place. Yeah, no, I mean, it's crystal clear. We don't have the full picture. I mean, you know, one of the things my teacher David kept pointing out to me is that, yeah, we're going through these stages. Yes, maybe we're having these huge ex experiences of awakening. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the big picture of things, we actually don't really know much. You know, it's like we really don't have to, we don't have a clue. And so we have to be very careful, you know, how arrogant and how proud we become. Yeah. Of course, some people feel like, you know, well, once you're enlightened, that's it. You're not going to get reincarnated anymore. Um, so there's no, and in fact, there's no individuality left. So there's no, no possibility of any further development or refinement. Um, comment on that? I mean, yeah. Have you ever met someone who doesn't have an individuality? Not that I know of. Yeah. yeah. At least I mean, they, I all, think they it's, all appear to. Yeah, they all appear to. Amma you know? has one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Amma has one. I mean, she can be funny. She can be fierce. You know, <laughs> she yeah. can be all kinds of things, whatever God calls upon. But yeah, I think we all have an individuality. In a sense, to deny our individuality is to deny, you know, an aspect of God. Mm. So all these stages of awakening that you've described, I get the feeling that each one is kind of digested, as it were, and added to your repertoire, and uh, that, you know, the flashiness of the initial transition passes, but that there is still, uh, that, you know, it, it kind of becomes part of your foundation, and that each awakening is still there, if you care to notice, that whatever quality dawned with each awakening is still part and parcel of your experience, but it, we assimilate it, it becomes par for the course, and then we kind of move on to, to further things. Is, is that a fair summation? Yeah, abs absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can remember talking to John Bernie once and you know, talking about this big heart awakening or whatever, and he's like, oh yeah, you'll get used to that. And I was like, there's no getting used to this. And he's like, oh yeah, okay, you get used to this. You know, but at the time, you almost get upset, you know, like, right how could you ever get used to this, you know? And it's like, yeah, it, it integrates within you. It just becomes a normal part of your everyday experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do, uh, okay, so we haven't really covered the Kundalini awakening thing yet. Um, let's get on to that. We kind of, because it is quite a story. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people go through this stuff. Sometimes people who have never heard of Kundalini and, uh, you know, don't know what's happening to them and perhaps you know check themselves into a psychiatric ward or something so i think it as it see it seems to me that as more and more awakenings take place around the world this kind of thing is going to happen more and more and it's got to become more common knowledge so that we don't have tragedies where people are you know given thorazine or something where they really need some more spiritual guidance sure sure i think kundalini is probably the the most difficult uh awakening you know, to work. Well, it can be. Some people, you know, they just experience it just opens up and it moves smoothly through their being. Uh, with me, I, I never did any type of kundalini yoga or was, did the breaths or any of that kind of stuff. But um, just being in the presence of my teacher, David, uh, for about eight years, I just had intense energy always moving through my body. And that was just normal. I mean, it was to the point of driving me crazy. But at some point, uh, I had all this energy in my back, especially my spine, but just all out throughout my back. And I had eight years of just intense pain. And, you know, I would cry every day. I was in so much pain. I would. Because it was lay... blocked. Because it, it was blocked, sure. You know, um, or, or it was purifying and, and the pain, the purification was yes. painful. Yeah. So it was, it was just, I just had so much energy in me. And I didn't know what it was. I just thought that there was something physically wrong with my back. Or I did something wrong in my back. I just 
thought, God, I'm in just like I was in such pain, Rick. I couldn't even think straight. Wow. You know, like so I would cry every day. Um, <laughs> it's gonna break my heart just uh, thinking about that experience. But um, you know, I'd lay flat on the floor, you know, just for hours. I could barely cook my kids' dinner, and um, you know, I just would come home from work and I would just lay on the floor and there's times that I'd just crawl and you could barely crawl into bed or barely crawl out of bed. And then there was times when it would just, it would just like open and all of a sudden I'd be like in ecstasy and I'd be like, Oh my God, I feel incredible. And so I went back and forth, you know, for a number of years with that. And I was seeing my teacher David a lot and Aja a lot during this time. And um, I was also getting a lot of body work done. And uh, one day I was getting some body work done and, um, this guy was giving me a massage and all of a sudden I started having a seizure, you know, he was on the floor and, you know, he turned pale. An and actual seizure where you kind of went unconscious or something or the kind of I ne- the Kriya I never, thrashing around kind of thing. Yeah. The Kriya, I guess the, I call them seizures because most people don't know what Kriya, Kriyas are, but yeah, it's the thrashing around and yeah, yeah. this energy, you know, my, I'd get stuck like this right, or my right. back would arch and all these mm-hmm. weird, obscure ways. My hands would make these bizarre mudras and do all kinds of things and and it felt like such amazing ecstasy um just felt like you know felt like i was on some crazy drugs i'm not haven't done drugs but it felt you know what i imagine you know say heroin or something would feel like it was just so definitely not like heroin heroin uh, heroin totally dulls you out (laughs) oh okay sorry so i thought that would be ecstasy but um You know, it just felt just so, and it felt like energy was raging up my spine, out my hands, down my feet, and, you know, um, I had trouble talking, I had had trouble just walking out of the guy, you know, the guy was ready to call the ambulance, I was like, no, because I knew what it was, I was like, oh, just let me, let me call a friend or get me someone who can drive me home, and so that went on for about two years of just intense, experiences there was times i couldn't hold the fork couldn't hold the cup uh i couldn't think straight got my words all confused any kind of neurological thing just would go through i mean i hate i i have to be careful talking about this because so many people would come to me oh let me heal you let me tell you what's wrong with you let me diagnose you and so you know i had that go on for years but um yeah, it was it was amazing, and I couldn't sleep sometimes for months at a time, which is then you know your brain. Couldn't it's, sleep it's, at all, or couldn't sleep well. I couldn't sleep at all. Wait, can you, you know? can you live for months at a time without any sleep? I mean, yeah, I mean, I would just lay there, yeah, and just feel like zzz, you know, just like so much energy. I mean, it was not lacking energy. And sometimes I just lay there, I just put a hand on my heart, hand on my belly, and just breathe through it. And, you know, there was probably periods of times when I got some sleep. But, you know, overall, for two years, I had tr- tremendous trouble sleeping. Mm. I mean, I would just lay in bliss, and I don't know what would happen. You know, I mean, it definitely was not sleep. You know, it was just like laying there and just vibrating with energy. And, Still to this day, I have a lot of trouble sleeping, and you yeah. know when I teach, I have trouble sleeping. When I sometimes, if I meet with too many individuals in a day, I have trouble sleeping, and you know, and, and I mean the Kundalini stuff. I mean, I I could probably write a book on all those experiences, but it was probably similar to what um, what's his name, uh, Gopi Krishna went through. Mm. You know, of just intense pain, intense bliss. Yeah. You know, um, all kinds of just states and there was also burning purifying energies like it felt like it was raining acid in my head for you know six months like you know Aja he laughed at me about that he's like yeah good luck with that (laughs) you know like you know it's it's just so much what people go through and and you know most people what most people say is when you know they come to me or their biggest question is is how do I make this end and see, that's absolutely the wrong question. You know, the question is, is how can I surrender to this in a greater and greater way? Because what, what an experience like this will do to you, you know, overwhelming pain, you know, almost being pushed to the brink of insanity, 
the brink of craziness, overwhelming, you know, just experiences of, say, just forces just pushing themselves through you. Basically, it's going to teach you to surrender or suffer. And so the invitation is, is can I surrender to this too, you know, fully and completely? Because anywhere you, anywhere you try to deny it, anywhere you try to avoid it, you know, the pain just gets worse. Yeah. So first of all, Irene passed me a note that said, you can have Kundalini waking and still need professional medical help, mental help. So I just want to throw that in. Oh, uh, yeah. And but it so, should be somebody who knows what it is, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I've actually worked with a lot of people who've gone mad with Kundalini, where they're like, I am the Messiah now. And I'm like, hey, man, you're not the Messiah. <laughs> you're having an incredible experience. I'm the Messiah, you, so you couldn't be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's like, see, that's why it's good to have spiritual practice. You know, right. if, you have, if you're rooted in spiritual practice, spiritual discipline, you'll know, you know, most fundamental teaching is, don't believe your thoughts. Don't believe your feelings. Mm -hmm. If you're overwhelmed with feeling and overwhelmed with thoughts, you know, it's going to be hard not to believe them. So a lot of people go mad, you know, like literally, you know, get blown into schizophrenia or temporary states of delusion. And I, you know, since I'm trained as a, you know, a counselor, you know, and I'm, say I never really worked with mental health, you know, before. But, you know, it's good to be like, oh, yeah, like you're having some delusions here. And can you come back to your core, mm. you know, come back to the truth of your heart, just that basic simplicity. And like Aja was telling me in the beginning, can you come back to that basic simplicity? What's here all the time? There's a quiet here and there's just an awake sense of intelligence. Can you rest in that and not rest in you know, oh, I'm the Messiah, or I'm the awakened one, or I now have healing energies, or, or I'm, you know, excuse my language, but batshit crazy because I'm in so much pain, I th can't think clearly. You know, you can see that you're in pain. You can see that you're being overwhelmed. So can you rest in that quiet silence? But most people, unfortunately, they don't have good teachers, or they don't, or excuse me, they don't have a teacher you know, or their teacher doesn't know what the hell it is, or their teacher told them to do do these breaths. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think the kundalini breaths are probably the, the worst thing you can do, you know, because it gets all that energy excited and gets it going. And you have to be really mature if this stuff wakes up in you and, uh, and to be able to remain sane. If that yeah. makes sense. But, no, but sometimes totally it, it awakens in people who aren't mature, mm -hmm. who don't have spiritual practices. And, you know, I always say, oh, boy, like, God, what are you doing <laughs> to this person? <laughs> but, you know, that's between them and God. And, you know, if I can help, I definitely get them grounded, yeah. you know, and just say, OK, let's get your feet on the ground. Let's focus on what you need to do. And can you both breathe through this energy, allow it to move through you, surrender to it totally and not believe what you think or what you feel in relationship to this energy. Yeah. And that's quite difficult for most people, myself included. I think it's good to point out that, you know, it is a powerful thing we're talking about here and not something to sort of toy around with. Um, oh, yeah. What you said in the beginning, some people end up in mental institutions, yeah. you know, or some people, you know, something like this takes all of your money. You know, it may take your wife and your your kids away. It may take, you know, everything you knew, you know, to be permanent about your life away from you. But, you know, again, can you come back to that basic sense of sanity and allow this energy to move through you? And most anyone I work with in this, they're, you know, they're going, I can't do this. And it's true, you can't do it. And so that's the invitation is, can I surrender that too? and surrender and trust in a greater and greater way. And then in the end, you and that energy become one. It doesn't become there's me and there's Kundalini. There just becomes this one vibrant movement, this dynamic force moving through your being. Mm -hmm. And in addition to this more kind of psychological 
advice sure. like can I surrender and stuff wouldn't you also advise very good grounding things like you might want to start eating a heavier diet you might want to start sure. jogging or, or you know lifting weights you might want oh, to absolutely. get get massage and you know any number of things you could do that might kind of ground and integrate you uh -huh. and in addition to you giving advice to people like this there are people like Bonnie Greenwell and Joan Harrigan at the Kundalini Care place in Tennessee who, who specialize in dealing with people who are having sure. this kind of issue yeah, and what, what you said is absolutely true. Can you get grounded, you know? Can you get your feet in the dirt, you know? Can you walk on the grass, you know? Can you just do whatever you can to get yourself fully grounded, fully embodied? And again, while you're going through the experience, it'll sound crazy, you're like, there's nothing I can do. But, you know, can you breathe through it? Can you walk through it? Can you eat a yeah, heavier diet? Can you do a very gentle Hatha yoga, mm -hmm. you know? Can you work with, say, a therapist or a counselor who can help open these blockages within, within you so that that energy can begin to move more smoothly through you? Yeah, things like that are, are absolutely helpful. I would definitely, you know, stay away from anything that excites the energy, right. any, you know, yoga that's harsh or, you know, moving a lot of energy, any, any of those breaths, any crazy meditative practices where you're running energy or moving energy. Yeah. Things like that you definitely want to avoid. I mean, some of that stuff can be okay under the guidance of a competent person, but you wouldn't want to pick up a book in the New Age bookstore on, you know, intense pranayama practices and start doing, yeah. doing them for an hour or two a day because sure. you could really flip your lid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, so with you, is, is there still kundalini stuff going on or has it pretty much run its course and everything is smooth? It's smooth for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it, it, it definitely intensifies at different times, you know. Um, you know, so say like when I went to the sand conference this year, it, it intensified. When, when I go on retreat, it intensifies. When yeah. I teach, it intensifies. Um, when I work with individuals, it intensifies. Sometimes it just, I'll drive down the road and, you know, it'll intensify. For the most part, it's, it's very calm, you know. Um, but uh, and then it's just kind of just in the background. But yeah, for a while it was causing a lot of trouble. I mean, it's actually, you know, people around me were starting to have it. You know, so it became a real problem for my wife for a little bit. And you know, it's like, oh boy, <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't wish this experience on anybody. But um, you know, it's just, I mean, it's part of life, I guess. Yeah. And in your experience, um, would you say that you were? And, and your experience both personally and as a person who's kind of been tuned into the spiritual scene for quite a while, would you say that your Kundalini history was a little bit on the extreme end and that most people don't have to go through anything this yes. um, traumatic? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Almost everyone I see with it uh, are people who've had extreme experiences with it. Mm -hmm. And so they've found me on the internet and so they've They've contacted me. So I see a lot of people who've been through intense pain with it. But again, we have to keep in mind, if you fully open to it, it will radically change and radically reorient your life. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, like I was, you know, I think I was talking to Francis, and he said that his just is just a normal flow within him. And he said his, it wasn't a big deal. And, you know, I think all kinds of people have that experience where it's just a normal flow and it's not a big deal but you know like for my teacher david he said it was not a big deal it just it just went up his spine and it was just smooth and then you know when i talked to Aji about it he's like yeah he went through hell and back mm. you know and it you know drove him to the very brink mm. you know yeah so uh, it's good for people to hear then that, that you know going through what you just described is not necessarily going to be what's going to happen to them but no, I mean, I think it may. It's just, it's just sort of, it, it may. And the thing is, is we don't have a choice about it. Right. You know, I mean, you have a choice whether you play with the breaths or not. Like, I wouldn't recommend that. But mm -hmm. but, you know, like for me, it just came. I didn't ask for it. I had no desire. I had a desire to know freedom. I, I never had a thought to know what Kundalini awakening was. That was not one of my thoughts. <laughs> but it, it came. Yeah. And oh, boy, did it come. So, um, and then you had the Hara thing that we've already talked about, which was just the sort yeah. of the deep silence, the, you know, getting established. Exactly. And I think, you know, one of the things that the, the Kundalini did was it, it forced surrender, 
you know, and it forced a sense of, of total integration. And I think that kind of led into the horror awakening of just that there's no separation between me and God. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I just mean that just in down to earth, basic way, a total non-separation. So now, um, how long ago was that horror thing? Uh, about three years ago or so. Okay. So now if you look over the last three years and uh, as your life continues to unfold now, how do you feel like, what's the leading edge for you? You know, we've, we've agreed that evolution continues. How is your evolution continuing to unfold? It's just working with my humanity, mm -hmm. just in an everyday, just down to earth practical sense. You know, can I be more kind? You know, am I believing what I think? You know, different different thoughts come forward and you get, you believe them and you say, oh yeah, like I'm getting hooked here. You know, can I be sweeter? Can I be gentler? Can I embrace, you know, different aspects of myself, which, you know, I may not be proud of. You know, it seems like life gives me all kinds of opportunities to embrace uh, my egoic nature. And also, I'll say, say the, the collective egoic nature. Because in a sense, the, a lot of the stuff that arises within me, it doesn't feel so personal. Like sometimes it feels very personal. Like, oh yes, I'm being a total fool here. <laughs> and can I embrace this? Yeah. But also there's things that just arise within me just throughout the day. And it's like, I don't know what it is. But can I be willing to embrace it and meet it with love? And things feel more and more impersonal. And you know, occasionally, you know, if I'm going to be honest, there's personal things that come forward. You know that I still have lots of work to do on. Yeah, I can just sort of hear some non-dual types listening to this and saying, "Well, who is this me he keeps talking about?" You know, I mean, if he's yeah. gone through all these transformations and awakenings, how yeah. how kind of substantial or predominant can the Craig Holiday character really be? Because mm -hmm. it, it seems like he's still very concerned about it. In fact, you just described that that's really the leading edge of your growth now is you know, enhancing or improving or refining the the Craig guy. Uh, and, you know, f some people emphasize that, you know, there is no such person. It's like a dream character. And, and you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, dressing up a dream character in nice so clothing. So when you're in the transcendent state, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you like, say, any, any master on earth, I mean, they work with himself in a very humble way. You know, in a very humble way. And, you know, if you think you're done with yourself, well, then great. Then you can work on all of the collective consciousness of all of humanity. So <laughs> when are you going to, when point. is the, when is the work over? I mean, again, the way I see it is it's not, it doesn't feel like me so personal. Sometimes it feels personal, but you know, just from a greater perspective, you know, it feels like being one with evolution, that you're just willing to grow, willing to evolve, you know, willing to, to surrender, you know, as Papaji said, till your last breath. Mm -hmm. He was Mr. Non-Dual himself, you know. He, <laughs> so, was. He, so, was, he was Mr. Give up the search. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, you know, it's like, so that's, that's one perspective, if, you know, if you call that the evolving edge. And then also, you know, the evolving edge within myself is just opening to deeper and deeper levels, you know, of divinity within myself, you know, so I say divinity goes on forever. Well, it's like, my God, there's, there's countless worlds you can open to. And can you allow these worlds to open to you and come into your life and allow them to live through you as you? And you know, that, that work goes on forever. Yeah. I like what you said about, you know, well, if you think you're perfect, then there's that, that whole world out there, you know? Yeah. And, um, there's time for the, let the dog out. Um, there is a, uh, I mean, do you have a sense that more and more you have become kind of a, an instrument of the divine? Um, you know, you're not, not like you're some big world famous guru, but you're in your own way, in your own dharma, you're, um, you're kind of being divinely guided to facilitate the, the awakening and the evolution of others. Yeah, boy, that sounds uh, quite uh, <laughs> quite 
quite uh, grandiose. Um, well, it you does, know. though. I mean, you know, it's like if, if you know, you, you mentioned about the dropping of individual will. OK, well, if, yeah. there, if the divine is running the show, then mm -hmm. what are, you know, what is the divine doing with the, the instrument of Craig Holiday? Um, mm -hmm. Not just fulfilling his individual sort of wants and cravings, really, but uh, how, you know, has is there a sense that your life has become a sort of a a channel through which the the kind of the div divinity can flow into the world? Yeah, yeah, and a lot of times when I'm teaching, you know, when I meet with individuals, it feels like that, mm -hmm. and sometimes it feels like that if I'm just walking down the street, you know, with my little dog and just, you know, just just having this experience of just divinity pouring through me. And then other times my life feels just so basic and so quiet. It's, it's quite bizarre how basic and quiet it becomes. You know, it's like so utterly ordinary and, you know, someone could call it, you know, totally boring. Mm -hmm. And yet there just seems like just this wonderful, ordinary, profound peace that's there, say, in every moment, even if I'm making a fool out of myself, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. So you covered a lot in your book, and I took a lot of notes, and I haven't really even referred to them. There's all sorts of... But we've actually covered a lot of the points that I had jotted down. Um, and uh, so is there anything that you feel like we haven't really covered uh, that is important to you or that you emphasized in your book uh, that you'd like to be sure to include in this interview? I don't know. I think um, I think that's everything. Let me just look. I th I yeah, thought I notes. might write some notes, but mm -hmm. it seems like while you're doing that, I, I must. I just want to say that you know, you're a young guy. You're under under forty, so that's great. You you know. God willing, you'll have at least another 40 years of uh, doing your thing and, and letting it, uh, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see. I won't be around for another 40 years probably, but <laughs> seeing how it all unfolds uh, over the course of your lifetime. And, uh, you know, it's, isn't it an adventure? It's such, it's such an adventure. What I'm amazed by every day is how we have these ideas, you know, of what should be happening and how it should happen. And then oftentimes God has a different idea, mm. you know, how it comes forward. And so, you know, it's just, can we surrender more and more, you know, to that? And just, I mean, it's a funny thing being an individual. You know, oftentimes there's, there's, there's so much violence in the spiritual world against individuality, you know. But I think, um, I think I heard Hamid speak about this, just about our individual consciousness. And that this too... You know, is an aspect of God, and this too, is an aspect of being embodied. Is is can we just allow this divinity to live through us in just an ordinary experience of being human? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's quite it's quite wonderful. It's quite quite amazing. Yeah, Francis uh, Bennett has a nice phrase that he says to people who are hammering on this point of not being an individual. Uh, he says, you know, of course you're an individual. You're just not only an individual." You know? Exactly. I mean, exactly. Most, most people think that all they are is this individual. And, and when you kind of wake up to your universal nature, you might think you're not an individual at all, but you're both. Yeah, you're absolutely both, you know, absolutely 100%. Yeah, Rick, Rick, the other thing I saw just when I looked at my notes is just if we talked about just the different shadows mm -hmm. that can come forward. I don't think we did, but go ahead. During awakening. Yeah, uh, sure. And I think we did a little bit, but just in the sense that, you know, when someone has a transcendent awakening, you know, a big shadow that can come forward is you can have a greater sense of separation between you and life. Like I'm the awakened one and the rest of the life, the rest of the world is deluded. You know, so that's a shadow. There can be a tremendous aloofness that can come forward, a tremendous arrogance, a tremendous pride. Uh, you can become uh, incredibly ungrounded. You cannot take care of your life, you know. So far, I'm laughing because so far I've been through all these things you're mentioning. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I have too. That's why I've, I've learned about them, you know. But, and so, you know, these are the things that we have to be careful with, you know. It's just like, you know, like I was saying before, when someone comes to me and they've just had a transcendent awakening, it's almost like if, say, if you fall in love with someone and then you went and saw a therapist, the therapist couldn't say anything to someone who's just fallen in love. 
their life is perfect, everything's great, you know, they're floating on a cloud. But it's just, you know, it's not the truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we have to truly be humble, you know, with, um, if we look at the heart awakening, the shadow of the heart awakening is, is I only want to feel bliss. I only want to feel what's good. And so when we do, when we do that, again, we create a division between us and life. Because the true non-dual reality, it must include, you know, that which doesn't feel good, that which is painful, that which, um, you know, the parts of ourself which we want to avoid. And so, you know, the other shadow of the heart awakening is, you know, you fall in love with everything. We spoke with about that, about you getting in trouble, you know, through not having discernment or discipline in your relationships with others and causing pain. You see this. You know, there's some people, they, they wake up in their heart and they immediately leave their wife and go out and, you know, start another relationship or whatever. And, you know, it's like we have to be really careful there, you know, or we think that we think that this is the only reality, that the whole world is just this mushy, gooey, bliss world. And we become very insensitive, you know, to people who are in tremendous pain, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And with the, um, of course, you can become ungrounded there. With Kundalini, a lot of the shadows are, um, I don't know if shadow is the right word, but you can go into all that mental illness stuff. We spoke mm -hmm. about that. Um, there could be all the kinds of neurological disorders. We spoke about that. And then uh, with the horror awakening, there can be that sense of, the sense of dis disassociation. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to disassociate from life. Um, and I'm just, I'm not going to be present. I'm not going to be here. You know, and that can lead to all sorts of trouble. Yeah. Do you think there are any other significant awakenings beyond, be, be in addition to the ones we've enumerated? Well, yeah, absolutely. So the big one, which um, and I guess we didn't speak about, was what Sri Aurobindo was speaking about. It was, say, the awakening of God and matter. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. so that's that's something I cannot... You know, I can't claim, I shouldn't claim anything, but, but that's... It hasn't one. happened to you yet. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I think, you know, that's one of God waking up in matter mm -hmm. as matter and making this a divine world. And, you know, that, you know, that may be a day away or it may be thousands of years away. But well, I think, there's, there's God waking up in matter as far as, uh, you know, the, the entire world is concerned, but there's also God waking up in matter as far as our experience is concerned, isn't there? Yeah, and I guess I guess I was speaking about, yeah, in the entire world. I think it's going to have to happen in the experience of a lot of people before it happens in yeah. the entire world. And I think that in in individual experience, it's perhaps something more than you've than you've described so far. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I think as far as say the 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 extent of awakening, I think yeah, there can be countless awakenings. You know, I think we put so much emphasis on, oh, this is spiritual awakening, and now I'm awake, and now the game's over. You know, I think, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not being very humble, you know, when we're standing in that space. You know, I think, you know, it's like God goes on forever. So what we're speaking about, you know, it may be ahead of somebody, but, you know, if we look up, if we look ahead of us, well, my God, you know, <laughs> it's much more than what we can see. Yeah. It's a healthy attitude. You know, I mean, who wants yeah. to be... Uh, nobody who's really sincerely interested in all this stuff wants to be finished when they're not finished. Uh, you know, they don't want to yeah. think they're finished if they are, actually aren't. Yeah. Because you, you kind of you, you cheat yourself. You sell yourself short. Yeah. Well, and it's also a hell world to live in that kind of arrogance. Mm. You know, it's a tremendous amount of pain to live in a place and say, oh, yes, I am here. You know, and nobody else is, and you know, you know, I'm the only one, or whatever it is. I mean, it, it that's a hell world, and to have to defend that, mm. I mean, my God, that's that's got to be painful. You know, I'm. It's a confusing thing, you know, because people want to put a label on me and say, oh, you think you're this, or you know, or they say you are that, and they're like, yeah, but also I'm a total idiot too. You know, so <laughs> keep keep that in mind. You know, please. Please keep that in mind, you know, that I'm growing just like you, just like everyone else. And, you know, we, we just want to be really careful with ourselves, you know, not to, not to overemphasize one thing or the other, 
but to honor both and you know just a sense of you know being fully human and divine it's it's a it's quite a paradox it's yeah. quite a paradox and you know it's it's very true what you're saying the the, the correlation between spiritual awakening and 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 personal personal maturity in terms they don't of, always match no it can be very <laughs> loose i mean there can be very very saintly people who are doing incredible things in the world who don't have a heck of a lot going on in terms of their inner spiritual awakening and vice versa yeah you know yes yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true you know yeah. absolutely true yeah yeah um cool well it seems like i bet you if we were to have another interview in 10 years or something although it doesn't necessarily need to be that long but if we were to have another one you know quite a bit down the line um it would we'd cover a lot of the same ground but in many ways it might be a, a very different conversation in terms of what had unfolded sure you know by that time both sure. both for you for me and for the world yeah for the world absolutely yeah but something's unfolding and that's exciting and it it should give people hope and inspiration i think and yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, and I forgot to say this in the beginning, Rick, but I just, I really hope that when people listen to these shows, you know, this one or all your other shows, is that mm -hmm. just that we really listen from our heart, you know, because then we get the direct experience of, you know, what whatever it is that's happening instead of this just being some kind of intellectual thing. And so, you know, I think it's just um, a lot of us really need to focus our spiritual life in that way. Is can we experience life and from our heart and not just just from our mind yeah i think a lot of people do you know and i get really nice feedback from people all the time um, yeah in fact, in fact there's a testimonials page on batgap.com but um you know people who have you know even literally been suicidal and have had their lives yeah. turned around or have you know this woman told me recently her daughter was working in strip clubs and uh, not living a real happy life and and now she's kind of gotten onto spirituality and has become a real, yeah. real bat gap fan and also yeah very, that's got to make you smile oh huh? it's very gratifying you know I, yeah I, I really you know it's one wants to be of value to the world you know and it's gratifying yeah. to feel that one is ha is kind of contributing something like that yeah no it's really beautiful what you've done well I couldn't have done it alone there's yeah. I, Irene sitting here who works on it as much as I do if not more and uh, a nice band of volunteers around yeah. the world who do all kinds of things video post-production audio post-production jerry bixman who does all the equipment management and setup yeah. and there's a translation and transcription team which anyone listening can join if they like and uh yeah. so we can get it out to people in other languages and uh you know technical assistance from various people so it's it's really a, a kind of a nice team effort yeah yeah well, it's beautiful work you do well thanks rick for having me is there anything else yeah i want to make some basic uh, closing sure. points that i always make um so you know i've been speaking with craig holiday and he lives in durango colorado which is a wonderful place to live i think i'd move there if i could um <laughs> and i would get the season pass to the ski area um and uh he obviously works with people locally there in durango but also people all over the world on Skype and so if you feel like connecting with Craig uh, I'll be linking to his website from his page on batgap.com and it's what craigholiday.com yeah with two L's in holiday you that's got, right you got me singing the Bee Gees song the other day when I was thinking you know that song <laughs> holiday by the Bee Gees I do yeah it's a beautiful song um, and in any case uh, so go there and you'll find out everything that Craig is doing, how to get in touch and involved. And you, you do like, a, are you still doing that weekly satsang online that you do? Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm doing it bi-weekly. Bi-weekly. Yeah, and I'm, I want to start um, a group of people who want to work in a little deeper way mm -hmm. and who want to kind of stay in the group for a long time and just get some more support with that. So, Great. so I'm starting almost like an online school or, mm -hmm. or course. And you have some kind of email sign up thing so people can get notified. Oh, sure. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, okay, so... That's it about, and your book, of course, and I'll be linking to the Amazon page where people can get your book, Fully Human, Fully Divine. Um, and then with regard to Bat Gap in general, um, there, you know, explore it, look around. There, there's a past interviews menu, and under that, interview, all the interviews are categorized in various ways. There's a donate button, which I really appreciate people supporting, uh, clicking, rather, to, in order to support yeah, this. Yeah, pl please donate. Yeah. yeah. Um, Really, uh, it's necessary and, and appreciated. 
there is a place to, to sign up for my email list, and you'll get about one email a week uh, notifying you of each new interview as it's posted. Um, this whole thing also exists as an audio podcast, so you can listen while you're commuting or something. So you'll see a link that says, you know, sign up for the audio podcast. And a bunch of other things. We even have like a thing where you can download the BatGap logo as a screensaver and, some, and the, the BatGap theme song for your ringtone on your phone and stuff. So you'll see that under one of the menus, all kinds of stuff. And we, have, we plan to offer a lot more in the coming year and have some nice ideas in mind. So thanks for listening or watching. And uh, thank you again, Craig. Yeah, thank you so much, Rick, yep. for having me. Yeah, we'll see you all next week.